Good afternoon. So the next item on our agenda is item number eight. But before we go to item number eight, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson uh, so that we can reestablish a quorum. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin with Chair Moore. Present. Chair Moore is present. Vice Chair Brown. Vice Chair Brown is absent. I don't see him. Okay. Um, Member Bradford. Here. Member Bradford is present. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Present. Member Holder is present. Member Joan Sawyer. Present. Member Joan Sawyer is present. Member Lewis. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Did, did he say here? No, okay. Joan Sawyer is here. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, Lewis is Lewis. not. Uh, Member Montgomery Stepp? Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki? Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair? There are nine members of the task force. We need five for a quorum. The number present is seven. Uh, Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been reestablished, we'll turn to the next item on the agenda, which is agenda item number eight, witness panel implementation plans. Um, so we will be hearing from various different experts uh, today. This should be very, very exciting and dynamic. Uh, the first expert we'll be hearing from is uh, Professor Kevin D. Brown. Then we'll hear from Jalen C. Blocker. Uh, then we'll hear from Professor John Michaels. Uh, then we'll hear from Marilyn Van. Um, and then we'll hear from Brandon L. Green then Ishmael Bartley, and then last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Margaret Fortune. Uh, so I'll first introduce our first uh, expert witness, which is Professor Kevin D. Brown. Kevin D. Brown is a 1978 graduate with distinction from Indiana University Kelly School of Business, where he majored in accounting. He graduated from Yale Law School in 1982 after law school, he spent four and a half years working as an associate attorney for the Indianapolis law firm of Baker and Daniels. Brown joined the faculty of the Indiana University Moore School of Law when he left Baker and Daniels. He teaches law and education, race, American society, and the law, torts, and criminal law. He has published nearly 60 articles or comments on issues related to race, law, and education. He has authored two books, Race, Law, and Education, in the Post-Desegregation Era, and Because of Our Success, The Changing Racial and Ethnic Ancestry of Blacks on Affirmative Action. Brown has one of the original participants and founders of both the Critical Race Theory Workshop and the People of Color Conference. Um, and I believe that each expert witness has less than 10 minutes to speak each. 10 minutes? Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll start with Professor Kevin D. Brown. Thank you for uh, having me. Hi, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address such an important task force. Um, as the chairman said, my name is Kevin Brown. I was a law professor for the past 35 years at Indiana University Meyer School of Law. This past summer, I retired from Indiana and joined the faculty of the University of South Carolina Law School. I've also taught at law schools at universities at, of Texas, San Diego, Alabama, and Illinois in the US, and London and Beijing University in Shenzhen, China internationally. In addition, I've been affiliated with academic faculties in India, South Africa, Nicaragua, and Kazakhstan. The primary law school courses that I have taught that are relevant for this presentation are law and education for 25 years, race, American society, and the law for 35 years, and for a decade, a seminar on transnational inequality, where we compare the struggle against racial oppression of African Americans in the US with the struggle of Blacks in the United Kingdom, Blacks in South Africa, uh, and Dalits, also known as untouchables in India. My academic research, which now includes over 100 publications, has generally focused on race and law, 
as well as the international impact of the African American struggle. I was also a participant in the first critical race theory workshop in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989, and three of the next five workshops. Finally, for four years, I was the director of the Hudson and Holland Scholars Program. This was a minority scholarship program at Indiana University, Bloomington, that was responsible for recruiting the high achieving Black and Latinx students. As my academic biography indicates, I have done a tremendous amount of researching, writing, teaching, and lecturing about issues impacting the African American community from both a national and international perspective. With my 10 minutes, I want to make a few points that draw upon my academic experience. First, I want to apologize that I limited my written testimony. I'm deeply involved in both the political and legal efforts to defeat the wave of anti-CRT legislation sweeping the country. Since state legislatures are in session during the first few months of the year, I've had to devote a tremendous amount of my time to that effort. You have a copy of my written testimony that endorses the idea that the beneficiaries of repar reparations in whatever form they may take should strongly privilege those Black people in the U.S. who are descendants of two American-born Black parents, as determined by the one-drop rule. I know this is an issue that has been addressed, but I wrote about this topic because I believed it to be the most difficult topic for the task force. I won't go further into this other than to point out that the title of my second book is because of our success, the changing racial and ethnic ancestry of Blacks on affirmative action. This is a book that delved deeply into which racial ethnic group of Black people should be preferred for affirmative action. I think anyone can see the analogy between the beneficiaries of affirmative action and the beneficiaries of reparation. In order to set up what comes next, I need to say that the problem that African Americans have is principally rooted in the dominant culture of American society. American culture, almost from its very beginning, developed a view that viewed it as normal for Black people to have less. In other words, we are dealing with a belief that is centuries old. This belief justified slavery and segregation. Thus, the solutions have to address what is needed to change the dominant cultural view of African Americans in the US, in major part by creating intergenerational wealth for Black people most hurt by this history of discrimination. I would urge you to use reparation funds to change dominant American cultural attitudes that have normalized the belief that Black people should have less, build intergenerational wealth, and leverage reparation funds to further benefit the Black community. With my vast amount of international experience over the past three decades, I have come to realize that the most negative attitudes about African Americans that exist in the world exist in the United States. When we leave these shores, we generally find that those attitudes do not travel. Clearly, our African brothers and sisters encounter a deep prejudice in many places in the world, but when people in distant lands learn that I am African American, I have consistently found that I do not face those negative attitudes. I know that there has been a tremendous amount of discussion about K-12 education, and I would certainly add my voice to those who speak of the need for more and better Black history being taught to America's young. But I want to suggest something that is seldom discussed. I would urge the creation of international boarding schools located in stable areas of the developing world for beneficiaries of reparations. Well-designed boarding schools provide a tremendous education for their students. However, the cost in the United States tends to be prohibited for public school districts. Such schools could be created for little more than what we currently spend on traditional day schools in the United States. For five years, in fact, I worked on a project of trying to get a school chartered 
by the state of Indiana or the city of Indianapolis for a boarding school that would be located outside of Accra, Ghana. Essentially, the goal was to transfer a U.S. education to Ghana. Thus, the curriculum would be that used in U.S. schools and the primary classrooms would be, the primary classroom teachers would be Americans. Such a school would bring to bear all that we know and have learned about academic success in K through 12 education. There would be a committed staff, more time spent on academic work, structured and nurturing environment, healthy lifestyles, this international educational experience, assistance in pursuit of college admissions, and for low resource students, there would be a change in their socioeconomic status. They would go from the deprived minority kids here to the wealthy foreigners there. Second, for the youngest beneficiaries, I would endorse a proposal that builds on Senator Booker and Representative Presley's suggestion of baby bonds. These would be accounts set up at birth for beneficiaries of, of reparations when, when they're young with annual cash payments made to them that they could not withdraw until age 25. Now, while I know that scholarships for college education for beneficiaries of reparations will certainly be among the programs considered, I would also strongly suggest using a portion of the funds to provide high quality college counselors for beneficiaries of reparations. This comes from my experience running the minority scholarship program for the high achieving underrepresented minorities at Indiana University. The overwhelming majority of black college applicants could benefit tremendously from having well-informed advisors about college. These advisors would not only help them through the application process, the standardized testing process, but also secure additional funding. Um, I would also propose that money be spent for individuals who are purchasing homes. The amount should provide for at least the normal 20% down payment. In addition, however, I would suggest placing a limit on the amount of money that a homeowner could mortgage beyond the 80% loan to value ratio. This would ensure that the homeowner would always have equity in their home. And then finally, I would suggest the creation of a program that would provide seed capital for businesses run by beneficiaries of reparations. These, this seed capital would be enough for them to get their business up and running. And if they are successful enough, they should pay back a portion of the funds that they receive from the reparations. I think with that, my 10 minutes are about up and I don't want to overspend my time. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much, Professor Kevin D. Brown. Um, our next expert witness is Jalen C. Blocker. Jalen C. Blocker is a current doctoral student in the Department of Psychological Health and Learning Service Sciences at the University of Houston, Texas. He is a Florida activist and former activities director of a community-based social justice organization located in Tallahassee, Florida. Jalen also served as a coordinator for Distinguished Young Gentle Incorporated, a nonprofit organization geared toward creating restorative spaces for underserved communities. Jalen is committed to contributing to a society where everyone can thrive boldly and apologetically as themselves. In the task force on reparations, Jalen is present as a social justice activist and former recipient of a state funded grant as a direct descendant of the 1923 Rosewood massacre in Florida. Uh, Jalen C. Blocker, uh, thank you for being here and you may begin your testimony. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, many things that I will share with you all today are ideas and sentiments that have been expressed in many facets. Uh, today, I hope to bring forth questions to consider as you all move quickly towards this recommendations deadline, um, and then also provide justification for a perspective that I believe would best support citizens uh, moving forward. 
Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump right into where my story begins. Throughout this time, I encourage everyone to engage in a little imagination, creativity, and critical thought as we recap my connection uh, with reparations and then also think about what reparations can look like in the future. In January of 1923, a white mob descended on the small town of Rosewood, located on the northwest side of Florida. A few days before, the mob of mostly white men received a single allegation that a black male from the town of Rosewood had interacted unlawfully with a white woman. Keep in mind, this is 1923, so that interaction could have been as simple as a glance from 20 feet away. The mob, however, that made no difference to them. In the days leading to the attack, the mob grew in both size and anger. Despite their vocal threats to tear down the self-sufficient Black town and lynch every Black man there, local police did not respond. Early in the new year of 1923, my great-great-grandmother had gotten word that the mob was approaching the town. In fear, she packed a small sack of biscuits and a jar of pickled cabbage for my great-grandmother and her older brother, only 10 and 16 years old at the time, and then she sent them south. Unfortunately, that was the last time that they spoke to their mother. For seven days, that mob terrorized the citizens and burned uh, the town of Rosewood to the ground where nothing or close to nothing remained. During those seven days, the state turned a blind eye and left those Rosewood citizens with zero protection under the law. With that information, I want us to think about what a 10 and 16 year old sent out on their own today in 2023 would be able to accomplish for themselves and their future generations. Now let's consider what those same children would be able to accomplish being black in the South and less than 60 years removed from slavery. Imagine how different their lives would have been if they were allowed to live in their thriving, self-sufficient town with a mother and community that cared for them. I am a living testament that they were able to survive. But we should always consider the way that racially motivated state-sanctioned violence prevented them from thriving. The most important part to remember, though, from my history is that while it is filled with tragedy, it is in no way unique compared to the experiences of other Black people across the nation over hundreds of years. Just two years prior in Oklahoma was yet another racism-fueled massacre. These sorts of traumatizing actions and condoned violence from states across the nation were and continue to be quite common. There is no doubt that for generations, Blackness has been targeted and bloodlines eradicated again and again. Each life that was taken at Rosewood is a generation of lives that never got the chance to lead. I acknowledge that erasure. And I also acknowledge the privilege that I have, that my story is one of the very, very few that even made it to the printed section of a history book. We must always acknowledge the millions of lives and stories lost from the sea to the tree, never making it to the textbooks. My last point as we establish this foundation is that I met my great grandmother. I have memories of her pushing me to read more and learn more because she was robbed of the opportunity to do so, never earning more than a third grade education. In 2005, she passed away, leaving behind her most famous saying, which was, I love you with a bushel and a peck and a hug around the neck. Let's fast forward now on our journey 71 years later to 1994, when the Florida legislature held a session to hear the merit of a reparations bill for the citizens of Rosewood, officially known as HB House Bill 591. Initially, the bill sought to divide a pool of $7 million paid directly to the living citizens from Rosewood. Proponents of the bill argued that citizens of Rosewood were taxpaying citizens and therefore deserved protection under the law, which we know they did not receive. After politicians received hate mail, some of which was alleged to be written by Ku Klux Klan members, uh, the bill took nearly a $5 million cut and the legislature settled on a $1.5 million pool to be paid out to those who could prove they lived in Rosewood and approximately 500,000 to those who can prove that their family owned property in Rosewood, comprising a total compensation bill of about $2.1 million. Sadly, due to information access barriers, my family did not receive a portion of this funding, and I can't help but feel this rings true for other families as well. Now, let's fast forward another 24 years to 2018 as I begin preparing for college. On the Florida Department of Education financial aid website, there was a section inquiring whether the applicant is a descendant of Rosewood. Knowing my history, I indicated yes, not knowing that there was a financial scholarship attached. Some weeks later, after communicating with my school scholarship coordinator, I found that the state runs a grant program, to this day actually, for students who can prove lineage from Rosewood. However, this idea always saddens me. 
to respond to the needs of Black communities. We have to step away from a prove it to me mindset and instead share the fundamental understanding that all Black people living today grew from a lineage that was intentionally disenfranchised by racism and state sanctioned discrimination. And on the rare chance that they weren't, we understand that regardless of their lineage, that legacy still exists and impact them today. Informed by our research, uh, if we can agree that the legacy of slavery has negatively impacted our healthcare system, education system, criminal justice system, housing market, and so much more, what additional evidence do we need to illustrate that a Black person living today has been impacted by the legacy of slavery and therefore deserves restoration? Circling back to the grant, it was paid as $3,000 per semester or no more than $6,100 for the year. To qualify outside of being a proven descendant of Rosewood, you have to be enrolled full time at an accredited Florida public university. You must be in a terminal program leading to a degree, diploma, or certificate, and you must owe no money to the government in the form of loans. While this may sound straightforward, when we think about it critically, we can see how there are several barriers that do not allow for this program to truly restore the harm inflicted on families. Again, the idea of having to prove lineage in and of itself is a barrier especially when you consider stories like mine, uh, where my relatives left with nothing but the clothes on their back and biscuits in a sack. Also, because the town was burned to the ground in 1923, I can guarantee that not one official document was backed up on a hard drive. My tuition and cost of living in undergrad were certainly more than $6,000 per year. So what happens to the student similar to my older cousin who didn't have the time or ability to afford to be a full-time student? Do they qualify? No, they do not. What about the student who had to take out some loans to afford their degree? Do they qualify? No, they do not. What about the student who, as a result of living in a low-income family, had to move so often that the official documents that would connect their lineage was lost in the process? Do they qualify? No, they do not. What about the person who couldn't afford a tutor to study for the SAT to get into a major university and would rather learn a trade at a local community college? Do they qualify? No, they do not. What about the Black child who is in the foster care system or a ward of the state and may not know their biological parents, let alone their biological great-grandparents? Do they qualify? No, they do not. What about the family that left Rosewood and went north and established a homestead outside of Florida so their future generations now live in that state? Do they qualify? No, they do not. I say all that to say that each of these disqualif disqualifying circumstances are all common in a people that has been historically disenfranchised. So including them as eligibility requirements is like expecting someone to repeat what you say after you shielded your mouth and covered their ears. You've already made it close to impossible for them to meet those expectations. So in this case, I would ask them, who are we really helping? Those privileged enough like me to have their stories published? If mine were not published, I wouldn't have found the marriage certificate of my great-great-grandmother to connect my lineage to Rosewood and would have missed out on every single dime. How many people in need today have had their histories erased? If I had the time, I'd be happy to connect how these circumstances of low income, less access to educational resources, destabilized family structures, and so much more are inherently connected to the way that this nation has acted and responded to Black people, and is even more indicative of their responsibility to restore the harm created. Dr. Byron McClure said it best when he mentioned the term paralysis of analysis in his podcast, Healing Centered Conversations. He argued that we often become so invested in studying and analyzing the impact of something that we become paralyzed and do not take the necessary action to respond and rectify that issue. Reparations are needed, that we know. But how do we move forward without inadvertently creating this false sense of eligibility? So let's fast forward one more time to a near future when we are discussing what are the best ways to implement reparations. I strongly believe that any actions of reparations should be approached from an abolitionist perspective. Maryam Kaba is an author, activist, and abolitionist and posed one of the strongest pieces of advice to consider in the context of social progression using an abolitionist approach. She argues or she shares that we should not ask ourselves, what do we have now and how we can make it better? But instead, we should ask, what can I create and imagine for myself and my community? If I were to put a wooden rocking chair in front of you all and I were to say, I think regular chairs are better, how can I make this better? The resulting transformation process would be rooted in destruction, cutting off legs here, breaking off rockers there, sanding down things there. And even then, the new chair would still resemble the old one. 
That's the current practice of reform, a pendulum swinging back and forth from one idea to one slightly different. But if I embraced abolition and was bold enough to go to the drawing board and build a new chair from the ground up, that resulting process would be rooted in creation, taking parts and bringing them together to create a whole that we collectively have imagined. We embrace this practice in technology. No one says, okay, you want a phone with a better camera or you want a TV with more color, then bring it in your old one and let's see how we can make it better. No, instead we step into a place of creation and innovation and boldly push that needle forward. As a result of that bold imagination and creativity, not only has technology improved drastically over the years, but people are so much more willing and dare I say happy to trade in their old systems for new ones. What if we use this perspective for social progression? How many new systems could we create? How eager would society be to jump on board and trade in their old systems once they see what we can do? Therefore, we can understand abolition as, the, as a mindset or the process by which we work together to imagine and create new ways to support one another and address harm in our communities, thus rendering old, violent, and self-serving systems obsolete. As I come to a con closing concerning reparations, I believe that they should be facilitated from the ground up by a new entity designed to be people-centered and passion-driven. Being critical in our thought and informed by our history, we should know that we can't expect the same systems that have harmed and disenfranchised these communities to turn around and restore them. If the profound change that's needed could be entrusted in these systems, then we would likely uh, wouldn't be having this conversation now. Likewise, the new responsibility of facilitating reparations should not be the sole responsibility of community-based organizations and nonprofits. As a former leader of a community-based organization, I know that they are already inundated with responding to the current needs of their community. This would be a community effort, and we need them to keep doing that unencumbered by new responsibilities. If we are serious about supporting communities to restorative practices, we can't build on the backs that have been do uh, on the backs of those that have been doing the most work for hundreds of years, but instead pick up the bricks and build something alongside them. Additionally, uh, this idea in space alone is an act of political resistance, and we know that 501c3s are not the best organizations for promoting and pushing political action due to legal constraints. As a professional advocate and proponent of equitable education, I believe this new entity should do a lot of things, but it should certainly prioritize education, both formal and informal. As research has shown us, education has some of the strongest buffering effects from the negative impacts of oppression among all minoritized communities. Likewise, we should be thinking about the preventative factors to success that many Black families face. Repair and restoration should be rooted in targeting those factors. Education, mental wellness, financial literacy, finances themselves, adequate housing, nutrition, the list goes on. Again, I promise as I wrap up, I want to add a bit of tangibility to my talk, most of which because of my passion is rooted in uh, education. Number one, across the nation, one in four children face food insecurity. Reparations from an abolitionist, abolitionist approach would mean mandating free school lunches for all students, especially those in low income schools. Pushing the needle further would mean partnering with Black farmers and agriculturalists to ensure that not only are these meals free, but they are filled with nutrition. Across the nation, racism has created food deserts, preventing communities from being able to access fresh quality foods. And science shows us how a healthy diet is correlated with better educational, behavioral, and mental wellness outcomes. Number two, as a result of racism, Black students are overrepresented in special education. And from the 1971 Larry P. V. Riles uh, case, uh, I know that California has to some degree reckoned with this idea. Nonetheless, an abolitionist perspective would set aside a portion of funding for parents who have children registered in the state's education, uh, special education program. This funding would be in the form of governmental vouchers uh, that parents can go online to purchase school supplies, uh, books for their child, books for themselves, and even register for classes at local community centers that better equips them to show up and respond to the educational needs of their child. These two fetal ideas alone illustrate how we can begin laying the foundation uh, for sustained success. I have so much more to contribute, but we'll end with this. When we educate ourselves, we are all uh, more willing and equipped to be effective in the lives of those who need it most. When we educate families, we offer them the ability to heal and grow from gener generational trauma. And when we educate communities, we have the power to change the world for the better. Reparations are needed. That is not a question. But to implement reparations, uh, we should engage in abolition 
abolitionist perspective to form a new entity that leans strongly on the power and process of community and learning to meet the needs of Black families and enact bold changes that will last for generations to come. Again, my name is Jalen Blocker, and I thank you all for working with me so patiently um, and for your time today. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Blocker. So the next person we'll hear from is Professor John Michaels. John Michaels is a graduate of Williams College, Oxford University, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and Yale Law School, where he served as an articles editor for the Yale Law Journal. He is a professor of law at UCLA School of Law. His scholarly and teaching interests include constitutional law, administrative law, national security law, the separation of powers, presidential power, regulation, bureaucracy, and privatization. A two-time winner of the American Constitution Society's Cudi Award for the scholarly excellence in administrative law, Michaels is a frequent legal affairs commentator for national and local media outlets. In 2017, he authored the book, Constitutional Coup, Privatization's Threat to the American Republic, and is currently writing a second book, tentatively titled Vigilante Nation, with his colleague, David Knoll. Uh, without further ado, Professor Michaels, you may proceed with your expert testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members of the ABA 3121 Task Force, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to hear from you today, be here to appear before you today. Um, uh, before commencing, I want to just note my regret for having to dial in remotely. I am I am local otherwise, but my daughter Annalise is getting um, specialized medical care in the Midwest, so I'm here cheering her on. Um, with her blessing, I've ducked out to participate in this hearing. She knows that I wouldn't be doing so for just another work obligation. While my students from research are obviously both very important, this hearing presents today a very special and concrete opportunity for me to contribute, albeit in an admittedly small way, to the future of the state my family loves and that we hope Annalise will be returning to soon. Um, I refer you principally to my written statement, but permit me to use the allotted time to underscore some main points. First, and I said this at the beginning of my written statement as well, the report itself is a tour de force. When I read it, when you first published it, I found it to be a tremendous achievement in its own right. It had the sweep and precision of a great scholarly project and the urgency, sensitivity, and prescriptive clarity of a muscular policy paper, and you, you are to be commended for that. But of course, the moment calls for far more than a report. And I'm particularly grateful that you're soliciting input on institutional design and governance and doing so at this stage of the deliberations. Given the challenge is still ahead of you to work out the specific substantive services, benefits, uh, and regulatory and adjudicatory authorities that will be entrusted to this agency, um, which for these purposes, I'll refer to the agency as the CFAA. Uh, I understand that Concern, there might be concerns about thinking about design and governance uh, as premature or overly wonky or esoteric. But I'll remind um, the task force of the old line by Congressman John Dingell, who said, I'll let you write the substance, you let me write the procedure, uh, and I'll screw you every time. The Dingell maxim is hardly something we chisel into marble on the National Mall, but it's nonetheless undeniably true. It's thus important for the task force to prescribe not only substance, but also set the procedures. Otherwise, you run the risk that others, including those not so favorably disposed to reparations, will end up dictating procedure, and as Dingle suggested, may undermine the entire enterprise. As I understand procedure, uh, and I understand it broadly, it encompasses considerations of institutional design, questions of staffing, and methods and mechanisms of public engagement. As a matter of institutional design, I made clear in my notes my strong endorsement of a freestanding executive agency. I discussed any number of alternative arrangements, all of which I think have serious, if not disqualifying drawbacks. Um, and I'm happy to use our question and answer time to run through any or, and all of these alternatives if you so desire. The only possible sticking point on the design at the macro level that I think is worth highlighting is what you should do about a proposed reparations tribunal. Uh, I'd make that quasi-independent 
And by that, I mean, I'd have it led and staffed by personnel who are somewhat uh, uh, operating autonomously and don't answer to the, the leadership of the CFAA. This is to ensure that any and all specific adjudications, so re resolutions of particular disputes, to make sure those are not influenced by broad policy or political issues that the CFAA head understandably and necessarily must prioritize. Again, I'm happy to delve into the specifics of design uh, uh, if and when you so desire. When we get to the next question, which is at the level of staffing, my basic recommendation here is fairly standard as well, which is to embrace the civil service. And I suggest to do so not just because that is the default hiring practice, but because it actually means something that's intrinsically and symbolically valuable. In this current political envi environment, we cannot assume that any new freestanding agency would necessarily be staffed by career civil servants. There's a movement afoot to circumvent or weaken the civil service, and it's been going on for decades. It was initially pushed by folks who categorize themselves as part of a business-like government reform crowd to make government operate more like a business. But now it's additionally championed by those most animated by suspicions of a so-called deep state. Both, uh, and both of them seem keen on removing professional protections from government employees. As I've explained in my academic work, civil service safeguards are a signature, if not the defining feature, that marks the modern era of professional, competent, and democratic public administration, and it's helped cement the, the political and constitutional legitimation of the modern administrative state at the federal and state level. Any turn away uh, from, the, from the civil service invites rethinking of those foundational sources of legitimacy. Uh, more practically, the civil service safeguards simply make sense. Career personnel are much more likely to invest in their jobs and professional development than are folks who are uh, political hires um, because they expect that they'll be cycled through fairly quickly. The civil service permits and creates space for respectful resistance if and when political heavyweights, whether it's within the governor's office, um, within the Sacramento lawmaker community or powerful special interests were to issue orders or to make demands that are outside or in contravention of the scope of the agency's statutory mission, or if just in general clear tension with professional norms and expert assessments. Because civil servants can't be removed at will, they have the flexibility and, and the power to push back and say, no, we're going to follow what the statute requires, what the task force prescribed for us. And last, the civil service strengthens the institutional culture and stability of an agency. The staff remains in place no matter how much political turmoil exists in the arena of electoral politics. And while there's plenty of examples um, one could draw upon to, to underscore the dangers of instability, the Freedmen Bureau itself, the, 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 the reconstruction project, um, uh, is a pretty good case in point about political turmoil and its ability to um, derail a worthwhile and essential project. So to be perfectly clear, while there are calls around the country, including uh, by Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, to gut protections of government employees, the task force's decision to reinvest in a civil service, one that brought us out of the unprofessional, corrupt, and hyper-politicized hyper mess that was the 19th century spoil system, and sustained us through the progressive era, the New Deal, and the Great Society, will not only serve the people of California well, will be an important marker for the nation that, yes, we can continue to build successful and virtuous government projects, something that's rarely been attempted, let alone achieved in the 21st century. Um, and with your indulgence, I'd go further. As I've again relayed in my written testimony, intimidation, abuse, and outright violence towards government workers has reached alarming heights. Workers feel understandably vulnerable and victimized and insufficiently protected. That's teachers, that's election officials, that's public health officials. While I sincerely hope that I'm wrong, I fear that a CFAA, whose work will surely span the policy realms of education, health, and voting, may be a particularly attractive target of political ire, harassment, and even violence. And for that reason, I would urge the task force to consider specially invested, investing in security arrangements and to favor arrangements that are more formalized and institutionalized rather than ad hoc and reactive. Assurances of, 
of an investment of that sort will help with recruitment and retention. They would also serve as a strong deterrent against those who, again, in this moment, feel particularly emboldened to express disagreement through campaigns of harassment and abuse. Um, likewise, I'm happy to answer any questions about civil service, about non-civil service alternatives, and political violence if the members have any questions. But I'd like to use my remaining time to pivot to public engagement and accessibility, which to me is the, is the complement. It's the other foundational core, uh, uh, bedrock of administrative agencies uh, uh, complementing the work of the civil service. And that's to have an engaged and energetic public that understand and engages with the CFAA as, uh, as valued and enfranchised members of the political community. Most agencies, no matter what their subject matter, struggle with public engagement. This leads to uneven participation and often domination by elite special interests. If any agency deserves to be truly a people's agency, it is the CFAA. And I say that for three reasons. First, I think an entity focused on reparations and explicitly responsive to the longstanding economic, cultural, legal, and political marginalization of Black Americans should naturally exude democratic accessibility and legibility. Second, I would hope that the CFAA becomes a model for the nation. So what you do will in large part dictate what is and isn't worthy and feasible in other jurisdictions. Third, I presume that there will be much curiosity about the new CFAA and no doubt lots of apprehensiveness and even distrust. So again, engagement will be especially key. With the presumption that the task force shares at least some of my thinking, I'd like to offer some simple modest approaches that may have some salutary effects. Um, I would encourage the task force to invest a little time in small details, including um, prescriptions about op uh, hosting the new agency, hosting open houses and listening se sessions at agency offices, engaging in social media outreach, setting up booths at town festivals, county fairs, farmers markets, carnivals, popular parks on holidays, and in mass transit hubs, to hold meetings in libraries, school cafeterias, and the like. And when passing out business cards, actually put human beings as points of contact. Um, consider also employing one or more deliberative democracy schemes to broaden and deepen the public's formal engagement with the CFAA. So but beyond just outreach, have institutionalized structures where people can come in and learn more about the agency and participate on, in an ongoing process. There are lots of ideas bandied about, about more um, uh, 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 depth in political engagement with administrative agencies. And I refer to two in particular. One is a process called deliberative polling. And another is to use essentially what are administrative juries, where you impanel cohorts of citizens who then, it's more like um, grand juries than, than petite juries or jury trials, where citizens who have the time to invest um, uh, effort and do additional reading, can consider and weigh in on particular policy questions with some degree of, of learned expertise. Not, that's not available for everyone for obvious reasons. So I would also create visitors lounges in agency offices. I know that space, money, labor, and security are all at a premium, but these lounges need not be elaborate or special, just a place to sit, to collect one's thoughts or paperwork, as interactions with government officials may, based on past experiences, be unsettling or intimidating, and to have people staffing those rooms who could field questions. Government offices can and are imposing in code. No one says things have to be that way. And again, I'm just talking about small amounts of square footage and a few dozen FTEs spread across the straight state. Liaisons like that who are on the ground can hear stories just like the ones that Dr. Blocker just mentioned about his family and about the difficulties of proving eligibility. They could pass along feedback about documentary hurdles, that there's not a paper trail, the evidence was lost over time, and push for alternative bases for eligibility in real time so that one doesn't have to go directly to the state legislature, to, to, which is quite a burden. Um, again, on, that, on the kind of margins, I would commission artwork from among the population of beneficiaries and, and put that all over the offices. I would encourage the task force to borrow from the lessons here of the New Deal, 
there's obviously not money or time for commissioning grand buildings and big architecture. And honestly, that might be for the best, but hallway murals, monographs that can be posted online and shared with libraries and schools, music that can be played in the aforementioned visitor's lounge, that's all eminently feasible. And again, light touches could go a long way. Um, lastly, on these points, I would say advertise. And I know that has a dirty connotation. Most federal agencies are expressly prohibited from drumming up public support for their programs. So members of Congress deem this propaganda and the government accounting office has sanctioned agencies for engaging in certain forms of public outreach. This strikes me as preposterous and self-defeating. Given the public's longstanding skepticism of government, their lack of understanding of the contributions government makes and now there's a special role the CFA, which no one knows much about at all, is going to be poised to play. It seems imperative on agencies to put more effort into countering false narratives, demystifying the work government does, and tout its success and why everyday members of the public can participate in all of this. Last, if I may, I want to um, just speak quickly about, because it's come up in, in some of the uh, earlier um, uh, hearings, and it was alluded to um, earlier this afternoon as well, about foundations and, and, and where uh, 501Cs could fit in. Um, I recognize that reliance on uh, a class of wealthy donors or private foundations for programmatic services and funds may seem especially attractive. Yet I'd urge this task force to be especially wary of, of those entanglements. First, I'd caution against any sort of sign that reparations ought to be treated as a form of charity or noblesse oblige, apart from rather than constitutive of the collective public responsibility we all have to provide recompense for the systematic, systemic racism that Californians endorsed, condoned, or unwill, unwittingly but inescapably benefited from. Already too many indirect beneficiaries of systemic racism insist that they have received no such benefits. To single that corporate charitable trust will foot the bill only furthers that misapprehension that only the very rich or only those who have the deepest of historical roots to antebellum times have been advantaged by generations of racist public policy. Second, with donors come strings. Donors may have particular and quite possibly idiosyncratic or somewhat self-serving priorities that if there's so much money attached to them will inescapably become CFA priorities. Credible reports indicate that big donors have tried and to varying extents succeeded in shaping and influencing policy with respect to such public outfits as Newark's public schools, the National Park Service and the Center for Disease Control. Third, uh, and here again, I'm thinking about California's place in the larger ecosystem of would-be um, reparations uh, jurisdictions. And there's a danger that California may be setting a bad or at least unsustainable precedent if it relies primarily on donors and foundations. Simply because California will be the first mover, or the first state mover, I should say, or because there's considerable corporate and personal in-state wealth here, a CFAA could soak up much if not most of all the available charitable money, leaving little left, left for those other jurisdictions which might really want to follow Sacramento's lead. So setting certain expectations that reparations will be privately raised rather than publicly financed may make it much harder for those other communities to embark on their own projects, let alone provide similar levels of support. Thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Professor Michaels. So the next person we will hear from is Marilyn Van. Marilyn Van is president of Descendants of Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes Association. She was born in Ponca City, Oklahoma, and grew up north of the Old Ponca Indian Reservation. The daughter of a janitor and Baptist deacon, her father, an original Dawes Cherokee freedman, registered in what is now Nawata County, taught Marilyn the importance of faith in God and the honesty of working for the betterment of the community. Starting at age 11, Marilyn worked hard and assisted her parents with custodial work when she wasn't in school. 
Her hard work paid off as she entered adulthood when she not only became one of the first members of her family to attend college after receiving several academic scholarships, but would go on to graduate with distinction from the University of Oklahoma. She received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and spent her career working as an engineer for the US government. She retired from the United States Treasury Department as a general engineer team leader in 2014 after more than 32 years of government service. Maryland's education and career as an engineering team leader emphasized teamwork, research, planning, goal setting, and the ability to work with persons of all races, backgrounds, and nationalities to get the job done. Uh, without further ado, uh, Marilyn Mann, thanks so much uh, for coming, and you may provide your expert testimony now. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, task force for inviting me here to be a witness today. Um, I have uh, uh, most of my activism has been in the last uh, 20 years, uh, where I have been the president of two nonprofits, one a 501c3, one a 501c4. Um, the, I am a member of the Cherokee tribe, uh, which is based in Oklahoma. And the fight that I have been working on has been getting justice for um, the blacks, um, the black descendants of slaves who have tribal rights uh, based on um, the uh, um, based on treaties, uh, you see there is a PowerPoint uh, in front of you here. Let's go to slide two. Okay, um, many people are unaware that um, the five tribes um, become wealthy and powerful. Um, in a large part due to uh, black chattel slavery. They have slave codes. And uh, these tribes fought for the Confederacy um, during the 19th century. Next slide. At the end of the Civil War, the United States uh, required the tribes to uh, sign new treaties to reestablish the government to government relationship. Next slide. So the Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole nations gave the uh, freedmen uh, agreed that the that their blacks would have all the rights uh, of equal uh, of other citizens would be equal have the right to hold office. The other two tribes, Choctaw and Chickasaw, um, uh, demanded the, that they would be paid and the right to adopt the freedmen if they wanted to. Next slide. Okay, uh, just to show you uh, that uh, what the Creek Treaty says, it says that these freedmen would have all the rights of, and privileges of native citizens, including an equal interest in the soil and national funds. As you can see, this is an act of Congress. It was signed by the United States president at that time in 1866. These uh, Seminole and Cherokee treaties are similar. Next slide. Okay, now, um, before statehood, there were, um, in the tribes, they didn't really have Jim Crow laws, especially, again, in your Seminole Creek and Cherokee nations. Uh, the, the freedmen were, the blacks were really doing pretty well. Um, the, uh, the Creek freedmen were organized into political voting units, and the Seminole freedmen also into bands. Uh, which were actually political districts. Next slide. Okay, now what are the Dawes Rolls? A lot of people have heard of the Dawes Rolls. Well, um, and so this just shows an example of um, a census card for a Creek Freedman who is a tribal leader. Next slide. Okay, the Dawes Rolls were made by the United States government. Uh, in order to divide the lands of the tribes, which were owned in common, when a citizen, whether they were black or an adopted white or a full blood, what's called what was, nobody used those terms of half blood, full blood, or the like uh, at that time. But these were not reparations. It was a person's share of the of the of the land that each member of the tribe owned in common. The United States wanted this because. Uh, a lot of white invaders were coming into uh, what is now Oklahoma. 
So they call the, they, uh, uh, so they set up these by blood Friedman sections or the like. But again, blood quantum was something just made up by the United States. Next slide. So the Friedman rolls, again, these were people who had certain rights based on the treaties of 1866. Um, and uh, I just mentioned here, even if a person that was listed as a Friedman had a mother or a father that was listed on the quote unquote by blood section of the rolls with the blood degree, that Friedman child did not receive a degree of blood. And again, this was based on how the US set it up. Okay. So, um, next slide. Oklahoma statehood, well, Jim Crow laws. First thing, bam, right out of the box. Um, black people in Oklahoma, and I know this is California, uh, but blacks there uh, were really fo focused on fighting the grandfather clause, all these terrible laws. Uh, Greenwood, a lot of folks have heard of Greenwood. That is mostly uh, Greenwood is mostly in the Cherokee Nation, although part of it, uh, the community, was in the uh, Creek Nation. And the United States did not protect, uh, use its trust responsibility to protect the, the Black people who were members of the tribe. Uh, they allowed these massacres just to go on. Uh, next slide. Okay, well, um, for the next several years, the tribal governments were not functioning. And again, this was based on US law. Um, the, um, but the, again, this changed in 1970 when the United States passed laws allowing the tribes to reestablish uh, elections of government officials. Next, uh, next slide. Okay, well, starting from that time, these tribal leaders began to push for tribal constitutions and tribal co co uh, codes to remove these black tribal members or to discriminate against them and receiving any kind of services, falsely accusing the freedmen of being non-Indians, being forced on the tribes or squatters from Arkansas or, th or other things, maybe even worse. Next slide. Okay, uh, just to talk a little bit about the Cherokee Nation um, the, uh, again, you had leaders, uh, Chief, uh, Chief Smith, Chief Mankiller, who were very opposed to the freedmen being members of the tribe. There was a tribal constitution, uh, constitutional amendment that the leadership tried to put forward. Um, the Department of Interior was opposed to this. There were some members of Congress, um, uh, that were uh, very opposed to this and pushed back against the tribe. Um, and of course, the freedmen people, we fought against all of this, uh, this removal ourselves. Um, there were um, the key case, Cherokee Nation versus Nash and Van and Zinke was one in 2014. It was filed in 2003. But this, um, in this uh, federal case, the uh, judge reaffirmed the freedmen had all the rights of native Cherokees um, and the United States never removed the freedmen from the tribe. There were additional cases that were very important that made this Nash case happen. But I'm the van person that is um, in this case, um, this uh, Nash and van case, as well as another case, Van et al versus Zinke. Next slide. Okay, Creek Freedmen. Uh, in the Creek Nation, the, the, uh, the, the tribe uh, tried to remove the folks in 1979 through, well, they did remove the people. Uh, the freedmen were not allowed to vote on this um, um, illegal constitution. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, Seminole freedmen, uh, the tribe tried to remove them. The, the U.S. government pushed back. Uh, they had to, the tribe had to back off of this, but again, tried to uh, continue to block the people from services. After a lot of pushing, um, the um, we freedmen leaders, we have been able to get Indian Health Service to um, uh, demand uh, that Indian Health Service services people. Um, um, and uh, which should have happened a long time ago. Next slide. 
Okay, uh, I'm mentioning here the House Financial Services Committee uh, testimony where I was a witness in 2001. I thank Chairman Waters. I just noticed her name is mentioned here. I invite you to look at that testimony because it has a lot more history about the tribes um, and, and the freedmen. Next slide. Okay, uh, last year I testified as a witness before the Senate Indian Affairs where I made several suggestions to bring equity to freedmen and I'm gonna try to hurriedly go over some of these now. Next slide. Okay, um, one of the things is the federal government was going to have to register the freedmen that are not in the tribes. Uh, the freedmen should be, whether they're members of the tribes or not, should have access to, um, you know, some of the tribal colleges, other colleges, healthcare facilities, uh, be allowed to uh, be Indian contractors. Next slide. Okay, just a reminder, um, now these programs for the tribes are not right, considered to be race-based because registered Indians are a class, not a race. It's possible the courts may see black descendants of slaves as a political class. Next slide. Okay, also I suggested freedmen organizations uh, contract with the government to run some programs uh, back black descendants of US slaves, could, same thing. Next slide. Okay, um, I mentioned here housing and veterans programs. Um, why can't um, uh, black descendants of slaves, maybe start out with veterans, get, uh, get some home loans, get some down payments, get some things to try to bring equity, home ownership, um, educational benefits, um, there's there's a lot of things the U.S. government could do or the state government could do. Uh, next slide. Okay, this just talks a little bit about the history of the descendants organization as well of the, as the African Indians organization. And next slide. Okay, this gives websites talks about some books, um, and so I am shutting down now um, and. Uh, because I've, I've went a little bit over, but thank you again for allowing me to be here and give witness testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn Van. I will now hear from Brandon L. Green. Brandon L. Green is a graduate of Boston University Law School where he was a public interest scholar and Martin Luther King social justice fellow. He is currently the director of the Racial and Economic Justice Program at the ACLU of Northern California. In his capacity, uh, Brandon provides programmatic vision and leadership for advancing racial and economic justice in the state. Previously, Brandon managed the Civic Design Lab in Oakland and was an attorney and clinical supervisor at the East Bay Community Law Center, where he helped create and lead the decriminalization of poverty clinic. He also worked as a public defender in Contra Costa County and as a fellow at Public Advocates in San Francisco. In his spare time, Brandon likes to write and podcast. His recent articles, Too Rich to be Poor, The Hypocrisy of Indigency Determinations and Mirror Mirror Anti-Blackness and Lawyering as an Identity were published in the Berkeley Journal of Criminal Law and the Harvard Black Letter Law Journal, respectively. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Brandon L. Green, you may begin your expert testimony. Good afternoon, Chair and task members. Uh, my name is Brandon Green. I'm the Director of Racial and Economic Justice Program at the ACLU of Northern California. Thank you for allowing me once again to testify before this First in the Nation Task Force and as part of this esteemed panel. In the past, I was able to testify about the racialized implications of gentrification and houselessness. Today, I'm honored to discuss my perspective as a legal practitioner on the necessity of a governmental office as part of the statewide governance structure that is responsible for advancing and amplifying the various ideas related to systemic solutions for the racialized impacts on Black Californians. The importance of such an office, given the ubiquity of the issues facing Black Californians as detailed in this body's interim task force report cannot be overstated. As a lawyer, I've worked in a variety of capacities that have demonstrated for me the need for such an office. My first job was as a fellow of public advocates, where I was both 
on the education and housing, climate, and transportation justice teams. This was in 2013. And at present, in 2023, Black students are still disciplined and expelled at disproportionate rates. Black workers are most overburdened by long commutes, and Black and brown communities are most susceptible to the impacts of climate change. Later in my career as a public defender in Contra Costa County, years after that, the racialized wealth extraction wrought by the criminal legal system still disproportionately impacts Black Californians. Black Californians are still pulled over at higher rates, even as white drivers are more likely to be found with contraband. For certain, recent legislation like the Trial by a Jury of Your Peers Act, the Racial Justice Act, criminal fines and fees reform championed by my colleagues and coalition partners in both the Back on the Road and Debt-Free Justice Coalitions have made some impact on these issues, but not enough. Currently, I serve as the first Director of Racial and Economic Justice at the ACLU of Northern California. In this role, I lead a team of dedicated attorneys and policy advocates who are working tirelessly to ensure that local and state government bodies act in a way that is fair and equitable. Something as profound, as historic as this body and its very detailed report on the acts of harm perpetrated on Black Californians must be followed up by something bold enough and with some level of permanence to see the work not stand as an academic exercise, but as an action exercise. The establishment of a Freedmen's Bureau or a similar office with a cabinet level position would be monumental in bringing the great ideas generated through these hearings to fruition. In my legislative and policy work, I've seen the power of the various offices and subcommittees that we as advocates must meet with. To advance criminal fines and fees or traffic court reform, advocates have to meet with the Department of Finance for the financial implications and the Judicial Council for, for implications on the courts. There's no such office or entity in existence that has either the stated interest or the stated mission to advance proposals like those recommended by this body. However, the sheer magnitude of the issues facing Black Californians demands the creation of one. As mentioned, when I last spoke to you all, I detailed the various on-ramps to houselessness in California from entanglement with the criminal legal system, the racialized wealth gap, housing rental burdens, deficiencies in overdiagnosis in mental health, care, and treatment. This one topic, houselessness in California, requires solving the racialized and persistent harm across various sectors to even begin to make headway. The discussion of time cutoffs of, for harm and the ways in which the myriad of, myriad of past and present harm leads to Black houselessness and the limitations of reparations specific framework again argues in favor of the establishment of such an office. At present, there are numerous bills being introduced that further exacerbate the harm of houselessness. There are also bills that we're in support of, including AB 920. There are not enough resources that can be mustered via litigation and legislation that support the continued expansion of discriminatory policies that seek to further criminalize and stigmatize unhoused individuals, many of whom are Black Californians. While the Reparations Task Force has been instrumental in providing for testimony, discussion, and amplification of these issues, there's not currently a mechanism for driving the long-term, sustainable narrative, legal, and policy change necessary to finally turn the tide. Given the enormity of the issues that so many brilliant individuals have testified and given voice to, and the myriad of proposals contained within the task force report, at best, we're talking about years of work ahead of us. This work should not solely be left up to individual legislative office, individual legislative offices or the whims of current and future governors, but must be solidified through infusing the work into the current bureaucratic structure. Of course, I recognize that the work of this panel has been in collaboration with the California Department of Justice and its Racial Justice Bureau. That collaboration, as well as the strate strategic choice for the members has been vital. However, the task force is currently set to sunset. In its place, something must be in, in its place must be something uh, transformational uh, with regard to the existing governmental structure. The South African Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission lasted eight years. In an interview with U.S. News, Nishan Bolton, an anti-apartheid activist who was jailed for over 20 years, had this to say. The commission's major challenge was that its mandate, time span, and resource base were very limited. Once it finished its work and hand handed over its report, it was then concluded. I think that the mistake has been made in South Africa was as the be-all and end-all of reconciliation. Rather than taking the commission as a starting point for a much longer-term reconciliation agenda, which was ma the major shortcoming not of the commission, but particularly of the government, most political parties, and perhaps even civil society, as they just wanted to get on with the reconstruction of the country. We have seen in recent years the talk and the reality of the racial reckoning that was not. 
Very little transformative policy was birthed out of the mass organizing that accompanied the death of George Floyd. We're now in a social political moment where blackness is under attack in history, literature, et cetera. In Benicia, California, where I helped lead Benicia Black Lives Matter, we experienced directly the power, privilege, and outrage that a single person can generate in response to the school district daring to distribute a flyer for our Black History video screening and scavenger hunt. I often ask my white friends and colleagues if they've ever seen the movie White Man's Burden with Harry Belafonte and John Travolta, in which the entire lived experience of Black Americans is turned on his face, as it's set in an alternative America where the social and economic positions of Black people and white people are reversed. I do this because most people I talk to cannot imagine a world in which every person to ever hold power of you has been white, in my case from preschool through law school and almost 10 years in practice as a lawyer. That's important because our lack of social and political power uh, is, is not sufficient enough to make the legal and policy shifts necessary. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is important because our lack of social and political power uh, is not sufficient enough to make a legal and policy shifts necessary. And that argues in favor of embedding the work of reparations and reparations related programming within the governmental structure. I think that the broad mandates of such an office and the contours of its work should continue to be discussed, but I think the question of whether or not an office should be established is an easy answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Green. The next person we'll hear from is Ishmael Bartley. Ishmael Bartley is a lifelong resident of California. He descends from people formerly enslaved in central and southeastern coastal Georgia. His grandparents came to California from Georgia around 1910, taking up residence in the Furlong Track, one of the first African-American communities in Los Angeles. Ishmael holds a BS in information systems from California Baptist University and an MA in theological studies from Liberty. He is the author of an upcoming work on Negro hermen hermeneutics. hermeneutics. Additionally, he has recently published the first of the Freedman Protocol Guides entitled the FPIBH, the Freedman's Protocol to Mitigate, to Mitigate Implicit Bias in Healthcare. In 2022, Mr. Bartley helped organize the Redress Institute, a think tank whose mission is to underpin the modern reparations effort with thought leadership, grassroots enablement, and narrative building data tools. Mr. Bartley is the proud husband of Teresina Bartley and the father of three adult children, Ishmael Jr., Miles, and Jared. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Bartley, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Task Force. It's a privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, the Redress Institute uh, is organized with the intention of uh, assisting and providing some thought leadership uh, that can underpin the work that the task force has been assigned. Um, we have some core beliefs that inform our work. First of all, we believe that the smartest single person in the room is the room itself. Uh, so we are beholden to the people. Uh, you'll often hear me speak in third person uh, saying we, and even if it's work that I specifically did, I will refer to it as we because it is informed by, by the broader cloud of witnesses uh, that, that, that got me here. While we use, we've been using the name Freedman, and uh, I think it's it's important that we clarify that we don't seek to find the boards and 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 the paint color that was used for the Freedmen's Bureau. I think rather we want to resurrect the Freedmen's Bureau in spirit. And uh, Dubois said, uh, had political exigencies been less pressing uh, and the opposition to government guardianship of ne Negroes less bitter and the attachment to the slave system less strong, the social seer, many social seers, a broad group of social seers could have well imagined a far better policy and a, per a permanent Freedmen's Bureau with a national system of schools and carefully supervised employment. Uh, there are two words that jump out, permanent and carefully supervised, and efforts to sustain the life of Negroes have, have been inundated with things that have, that have taken away the permanent nature uh, it, and, it, and dissipated the intent of, of, of the work. We concur with the, also we concur with the caller earlier who said that controls need to be put in place to ensure that the agency bearing the name does not perpetuate the harms that it's designed to alleviate, uh, in, in which case we'd need to be rescued from the proverbial rescuer. Bias pulls us into this moment. Bias is the boogeyman in California, and bias 
tends to be responded to with a dismissive nature. There's north of 2.5 million freedmen in the state, and I would wager that 90% of them can describe specific harm related to bias, yet that, that harm is dismissed, and with dismissal comes a discouragement. And when, and when people are discouraged from using the public services that their taxes pay for, you, you tend to see that in the form of outcomes. People that are discouraged to go to the hospital, well, over time, you, you see this, 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 this class of individuals who, who are suffering from broad-based from broad uh, ailments. Uh, and so, so specificity becomes generalized, and generalized specificity uh, d displays itself in populations. That said, uh, bias is the boogeyman, and implicit bias is an even bigger boogeyman. Implicit bias, bias is the thing that you see in outcomes, but you can't quite put a finger on. Uh, and so since implicit bias is subconscious in nature, and, but it's overt in its expression, we believe that protocols that govern this overt expression are necessary for mitigation. And we use the, that word mitigation of implicit bias with some hesitancy. We would love to eradicate it, but since, implicit, since the smart folks have said that implicit bias really lies deep in the subconscious, it, it's difficult to get at things that live in the subconscious unless you can get somebody to agree to psychotherapy. So to mitigate uh, this, this, this bias boogeyman, to put some kind of controls in place that will, that will enable us to then measure the presence of implicit bias and, and subsequently attempt to reduce its harmful effects, we propose, we, we propose Friedman's Protocols. And the first Friedman's Protocol that we are here to discuss is the Friedman's Protocol to, implicit, to, to mitigate implicit bias in healthcare. As, we, as we've been reasoning about this, a kind of Friedman's calculus has emerged that, that helps us clarify a general goal. Uh, calculus and analytic geometry give us the idea of the asymptote. And so what we want to do is we want to take implicit bias from being implicit to asymptotic. The concept of asymptotic simply means that as a function approaches a given, a given point or a given line known as a limit, that it gets, it gets smaller and smaller, harder and harder to detect. And we believe that if you put the right kinds of protocols in place, that implicit bias, while it may still be present, its effects will become smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller, and it, it, it will get to the point where it will become difficult to detect. That is what we would call a favorable outcome, and that brings along with it a number of measurable uh, outcomes. Please advance the slide. So the way we arrive at, at this present moment, uh, the, the outstanding work that the, the, the task force has done in the interim report, it, it clearly catalogs harms, and it creates a context from which we can reason and solution about redress. Uh, we also have observed mixed sentiment in response to the release of the interim report. Uh, we're aware of a substantial amount of dog-whistling narratives that were developed in response to the, to the interim report. Uh, these these dog-whistling narratives have been based on unstructured truths, and some of the best reductionist history I've ever read uh, we began, so we, we, we began thinking about implementation, and, and, and in, our, in, our, in our reasoning, we think that there's a need for a full stack set of protocols to protect and preserve the life and, li and livelihood of freedmen in California. Uh, so now while ideating around the Freedmen's Protocols, we had a series of what-if moments uh, that, that led to the current state of our protocol proposal, the FPIBH, uh, and the need for an agency to sustain the, inf in the in excuse me, uh, our what-if moments pointed to the need for an agency to sustain the interest of freedmen in the state and embody the spirit of the work that the task force has begun because in California, Law without agency is a recipe for quick and quick and immediate obsolescence. Please advance the slide. Our what ifs. Uh, what if we could get closer to removing the presence of arbitrary from professional services? If you're a professional, you've been trained, and you know that arbitrary is the enemy. Professionals should be responsible for producing consistent results. That ought to be a part of a professional's mantra. Uh, and, and if the state is licensing professionals, then the state is responsible for, for putting controls in place that, that, that create some kind of accountability for the, for the continued 
pr production of those consistent results. So we need to take arbitrary out, and bias is an arbitrary factor because of how I feel. Because of, of, of how you were represented in a movie I saw. I developed these ideas so I can, I can apply arbitrary uh, conditions to the service that I provide. The state is responsible for fixing that. Uh, what, what, if, what if the machinery of reparations in California includes protocols in healthcare, lending, policing, education, employment, and real estate that define how freedmen are to be treated and, describe, and, and it describes specific outcomes for interactions? Uh, we further muse that what if, what if there were statutes, which are laws in California, that required state agencies to adhere to the Freedmen Protocols? What if there were measurable criteria that could be fed into continuous service improvement processes so that we learn from mistakes and we could constructively make corrections to broken processes, thereby improving outcomes? What if we could get closer to mitigating the effects of subconscious bias through required actions, attestation, identification, constructive notice and reporting? What if a state agency existed to develop the regs over which the, excuse me, to develop the regulations over the industries and civic and public institutions that interact with freedmen's lives. This agency would interact with other state agencies who would implement the protocols in their areas of responsibility as proxies. But also what if administrative disputes regarding the freedmen statutes were, to, were were subject to the regs as written by the Commission of Freedmen Affairs. Now, I, I'm using uh, uh, an acronym called COFA, Commission of Freedmen Affairs, but I think it's been referred to as FCAA uh, throughout the, the, the name isn't really important. It, it, it is the lineage, it is the identity of the people that it's designed to protect that is, that is of, of interest here. Uh, these, uh, these what ifs were informed by our dialogues with a retired administrative law judge. Uh, he, he adjudicated administrative cases in, in, in the state for decades and he helped us to understand that as an adjudicator, for the, for the particular agency he was responsible for, he would hear cases from citizens and he would hear cases brought up by the agency. And, it was, and his adjudication could either support the citizen or the agency. And at times, the, the guiding law was formed by the regulations that the agency was put in place. The, regu the regulations were, de were derived. Regulation is derived from laws that the assembly passes. The regulations that a given agency like DPSS or, or the Department of Insurance puts into place, they are the implementation of the laws that the legislature passes. And th this judge told me that when he would hear cases, if his opinion was one that would be against the department, his, his, his adjudication was not final. It had to go to the, to the director of the department who could then interpret the regulations as written or he could follow the judge's recommendation. And so we're saying here that this Office of Freedmen's Affairs or the, the, the California Office of Freedmen's Affairs or the, the, the Freedmen thing that's gonna help some people should be able to draft the regulations and then act as the arbiter with the final, with, with, with the final, uh, uh, to be able to make the final decision as it pertains to, to, to a, a ruling in administrative law that may come from an administrative law judge. That is what we would consider teeth, um, or, or something in that direction is what we would consider teeth. Please advance the slide. That said, um, this, busy, this busy slide with all these arrows and pictures and boxes, um, we, can, we can get through it rather quickly. There's a blue box right there in the middle that, that says the healthcare encounter. And what this is, it's kind of an expanded or exploded um, example of the Freedmen's Protocol in action, per se. And so the, and, and the, the service provider we're using in in this example is the, a healthcare provider. Now, a healthcare provider is a hospital or a doctor or a nurse, uh, and healthcare providers are paid by payers in the state. There's, there's a few different actors we should acquaint ourselves with. There are prider, there, there are patients, providers, payers, then healthcare regulatory agencies, and then there, there are the le there's the legislature in, 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 our, in, in our universe of discourse. Patients, and patients intersect with providers at the healthcare encounter. Patients bring demand. Patients can be insured, uninsured, and they can be transient. And you could also have a, a, a Freedman patient that is a transient, but, it, but is also insured. Um, 
uh, patients bring demand to the healthcare encounter. Providers are supposed to just bring service. Come in here, assess, diagnose, prescribe. Typically, unfortunately, for whatever reason, service providers often bring bias into the encounter along with service. And so we, we, we're looking for a way to limit and decrease and reduce the amount of bias. You can bring your bias in here, but it should not have an effect on, on the service that you provide. So what we propose is, you see the FPIBH off to the right, that circle that it should be a green circle with some arrows then feeding into the encounter. And so the FPIBH is a protocol. Protocols are rules that govern behavior and action. And essentially we're saying that there should be some steps that the provider has to take once, once this person has been identified as a freedman or, or in the lineage or the, or the beneficiary community, this, uh, automatically there should be a protocol kicked in and some of the things in that protocol should be that a, the treat that there should be a treatment paradigm uh, imposed. It shouldn't be willy nilly. Sometimes I've been. Sometimes I've, folks tell me that you go to the doctor and it just kind of feels willy nilly. Now, and I, I need to just raise the flag and say we love doctors, nurses. We love providers. Providers are our lifeblood. Providers that they've studied. They provide a critical service. It, we, but some of them ain't right. And you, and, and you shouldn't be able to bring your ain't right into, into the delivery room with my wife and tell her that she doesn't need an epidural or that you should, your ain't right shouldn't govern how you prescribe pain pills. I don't know how, I, I don't know how I ended up being uh, 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 cataloged as uh, uh, being addicted to uh, pain pills. I went, my doctor told me, you, you're, you, we treat you like this because somehow uh, something came up and said that you, so now you treat me like I'm, a, I, I, I go to the doctor and I'm assuming the position, that's, <laughs> okay, back on course. You shouldn't be, this is, this is the effect of bias. And so these protocols, uh, would impose, uh, they, they would impose a treatment paradigm that needs to be followed. They would also impose constructive notice. Well, you, so, so if you identify, then now you, 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 we got to tell you that there are certain procedures we got to follow. Then you got to attest to the fact that this, would, that, that, that this was followed. And, and there should also be de-escalation protocols. Because me, if you brought hostility in here and, and I felt it, or I brought hostility in here, it shouldn't be your objective to get me out of here as quickly as possible. And it should be your objective to somebody needs to come in and de-escalate this thing so I can get my Tylenol, uh, my, my, my threes or, or my shot or whatever I need. That being said, uh, so, so now we, we talk about the, the mechanisms of the protocol. So how does this work? Uh, and, and it we is fraught like with less, complexity. Less than five Thank minutes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Um, the protocol. So, so payers, the providers, there's a claim that, that's created for, for every encounter. Uh, and and that, that claim is the lifeblood. The, the claim is sent to a payer. A payer is an insurance company. Um, and and it, it, so the evidence that the protocol has been done can be added to the claim. And the bottom line is, and this becomes a verification point, payers have got to check for the, for the, for the evidence of, of the protocol uh, or, they can't, or they don't pay the claim. And when you stop paying stuff, that is when you get motion and movement. That being said, in order, in order to bring this to fruition, you, if off to the right you see actor interaction. You've got to have, you've got to have regulations and an agency to impose the, enforce those regulations. Now today in the state, the Department of Insurance, DHCS, DMHC, those are agencies that, that, that deal with the various kinds of payers in the state. The, free, the, the Freedmen's Agency should draft the regulations, but perhaps uh, the existing regulatory agencies would be the ones who would implement them, but by proxy. And again, the, the, the same scenario that was, that was described earlier where the, the, these regs, the, the Freedmen's Affairs Office owns the regs. And so if there's a dispute, if there's an appeal, the Freedmen's Affairs Agency would have the final say uh, in, in the execution of the, the, the regs. Please advance the slide. And so with the, 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 one more busy slide, and, and this is simply, has, just has some assumptions. And the biggest assumption we should call out is just the fact that the legislature has got to pass laws to establish this agency and then to establish specific statutes upon which regulations can be built. And so you start to see uh, these terms COFA and DOFA uh, emerge. Uh, and, and I'm landing in like two minutes, uh, 90 seconds. COFA and DOFA. Uh, Commission of Freedmen's Affairs and Department of Freedmen's Affairs. And so please advance the slide one more time. 
And this suggested summary asks, since we have the opportunity, having earned this political moment and having evaluated the outcomes and insufficiencies of previous initiatives, Friedman in California and those who are of the lineage uh, deem it prudent and expedient to ask that there be an addition to government. In the face of this $300 trillion deficit that is coming, uh, if you believe the legislative analysts, uh, we, we we're asking for an addition to government in the form of two agencies to be named in a fashion similar to the Commission of Freedom and Affairs and the Department of Freedom and Affairs. This two agency model is suggested so that there is a commission that embodies the spirit of the existing task force and a department responsible for drafting, it, for drafting registration, re regulations and administering programs. A current example of this is the Commission on Aging and the Department of Aging. Uh, CCOA is basically uh, and advise, uh, excuse me, they are the, they're called the principal advocate, engaging in advisory participation in the consideration of all legislation uh, pertaining to older people. Uh, and then, the, and then their, the Department of Aging has a slightly different function, um, and their role is pr primarily to administer programs. The two agency model encompasses ongoing advocacy and administration, both essential functions. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Ishmael Bartley. Uh, the next person on our agenda is uh, Margaret Fortune. Margaret Fortune is changing what's possible when you create excellent educational options for black children. As a president and CEO of seven K through 12 public charter schools in Sacramento and San Bernardino counties with the combined enrollment of more than 1800 students, Fortune's work is pointed towards one North Star to close the African American achievement gap. Fortune has founded some of the top majority African American public schools in the state of California. A nationally sought after education expert, Fortune is often invited to participate or lead conversations detailing the Fortune School approach to successfully educating black children. A graduate of UC Berkeley and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, Fortune served as an education advisor to two California governors. Most recently, Fortune was inducted into the National Charter School Hall of Fame for pioneering the development and growth of charter schools, implementing innovative ideas and inspiring others in the movement. Fortune continues to increase her national footprint through her work as a steering committee member of the Freedman Coalition for Charter Schools, a national organization founded to protect the right of self-determination for parent choice for black and Latino families. Uh, without further ado, thank you so much, Margaret Fortune, and you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Moore. I'm pleased to be able to join you in person. I want to talk today about a recommendation that the task force made that black students should be added to the local control funding formula for public schools right alongside English learners, low-income students, and foster youth. This is an idea that is currently being discussed um, in the legislature and with the administration, and an idea that was the subject of an assembly bill, uh, assembly bill uh, 2774. Uh, this is an idea that uh, I personally have been associated with for quite some time. Um, it was first raised by uh, Assembly Member Shirley Weber in 2018, and then authored again uh, last legislative session. I want, I'm here to connect the dots between these two conversations because the Black in School Coalition that I am a member of um, noticed that this body included the policy of AB 2774 in your recommendations, and we want to thank you for that. Um, we were the sponsors of the bill. There's something that um, Dr. Kevin Brown said at the start of this conversation that, that was uh, remarkable to me. He said, African Americans deserve less, that there's a mindset that African Americans deserve less. And if you look at the history of this issue, uh, you can see the truth in that statement. Back when Shirley Weber authored this bill, it would have generated $300 million for black students. This is actually a race neutral bill. Never mentions race, right? Because we have a state that will, make, will not make policy on the basis of race. There is a proxy for race now in California and that when it comes to um, students 
and it's uh, low performance. The lowest performing student group is African American students. So back in 2018, if those students had been funded as a student group, just like we do for English learners, low-income students, and foster youth, they would have generated $300 million for the schools that serve them. So then fast forward to last year, 2022, when Akilah Weber authors the bill, and the unfunded black students would have generated $400 million in, for the schools that serve them. Now, fast forward just a year. If that bill, which flew through the legislature with unanimous bipartisan support, had reached the governor's desk and been signed by the governor and was in this budget, on a formula basis, the unfunded black students would have generated $533 million for the schools that serve them. Unlike other student populations in the state that are declining, what happened year over year last year is that black student enrollment actually increased from 80% to 81%. I wanna ask you to advance uh, two slides for me. Uh, one more. Yes, let's look at the numbers. All right, I'm gonna bore you with data. Let's shake it off. <laughs> The, the first row is what AB 2774 would have done, not on the basis of race, which is what was in your policy, but on the basis of low academic achievement. Right now, black students, 70% of black students don't read or write at grade level on the SBAC, which is the state test. That's up two percentage points from the prior year. It's gotten worse in just one year. In mathematics, 84% of black kids aren't doing mathematics at grade level on the state testing. So, and that's up from 78% last year. And the reason why the number of black kids has increased who are in the unfunded category is because year over year, more African American students were retained in high school. It's not because of new births at kindergarten, it's because of being held back at the end of the race in high school. That's what's contributing to that number being bigger. So the governor made a promise that if the bill was pulled back, he would include in his January budget something to address the issue raised by AB 2774. And the issue is that black students are chronically underperforming, but we don't say black in California. We're the don't, don't say black state, which makes it a little difficult to have a reparations conversation if you can't actually name black people. And just as somebody who has created schools for black people, we don't do well with anonymity. You can see us coming and you can hear us coming. You can hear my drum line coming, right? You can see my teams coming, they're in bright orange. But we're in a state where we don't acknowledge blackness. And something that was just really interesting that Marilyn Vann said was that Native Americans, that's not a race, that's a political class. And I suppose that's why we can have free tuition for Na Native American students at the University of California that was just adopted by the UC Regents last year. But we can't have a bill that doesn't name black students because of Prop 209, because if you do the math and say no matter how you cut it, black students are the lowest performing groups, because they would be the beneficiaries. So we're in a state that was saying to us, we will not do anything in particular for black children. That is problematic, right? But let's see what happened in the governor's January budget. And this is a starting point, not an ending point, right? So there's room for negotiation, but he, change the conversation to fund the lowest income schools and student groups with the lowest performance on one or more state indicators on the California dashboard. So it's a very different conversation to fund the lowest performing schools in the state than the 
I mean, I'm sorry, the lowest income schools in the state than the lowest performing children. Those are two different things. If you fund the lowest income schools in the state, that means the bottom 5% of all schools in the state and only 6% of the kids in those schools are actually black. So how do black kids fare in the governor's proposal? Well, first you've cut the 533 million that, would, that they would generate on a formula basis down to 300 million, which is the figure from 2018 from Shirley Weber. That's the poetic justice there, right? <laughs> That's where that's from. But you cut it down by $233 million. And black kids, since they're not in those, the black kids we're talking about are not in those low-income schools. Because if, these, if that 81,000, if those kids were low-income, they would already be funded through the local control funding formula. They would already be generating supplemental grants to their schools. They're not low-income. They're not low-income. Those 81,000 kids are the black kids who are not low income and perform worse in math than low income white kids. Those kids, some of those kids live in the suburbs. What did Willie Brown say about getting on the, on the bus in San Francisco? He was the same as any, he used a particular word and said he was the same as everybody else on the bus in San Francisco. This is an issue of race that we can't call by its name because we don't say black. Wow. But let's, 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 so that means that 5.4% of the $300 million would go to black kids. So instead of getting $533 million a year, not because they're black, but because they're the lowest performing, they would get 16 million. That, as someone who's been an education advisor to two California governors, that is like nothing. That's why the advocates are saying, wait a minute, this is, this is crumbs. This is not systemic change. So, and the other thing is that once they whittle, this, this proposal whittles down to only 5% of the schools, it says within that, you need to be the lowest performance on one or more state indicators on the California school dashboard. So it changes the metric to the dashboard. So people who are into education know that that's multiple measures. Some of it's test scores, some of it's suspension, some of it is, uh, is attendance. So let's advance one more slide and see who has one or more of the very lowest. So first of all, you gotta be in the poorest school and then you have to be at the bottom of the barrel, the very lowest performance indicator. I'm gonna orient you towards this table. The student groups that are acknowledged by the state are on the left, student, um, are on the left under group. There's all students, there's foster youth, these are, there are, are students with disabilities, homeless, African American, American Indian. Can, applaud if you can follow that column just so I know you're following me. Okay, these are not categories made up by advocates. These are categories in the education code already, right? English learners, Hispanic, Pacific Islanders, socioeconomic disadvantage, et cetera. Across the top, you have these multiple measures that are in the California school dashboard, English language arts, math, suspension rates, graduation rates, and chronic absenteeism. The worst you can do in chronic absenteeism to, is to be very high. So according to the governor's proposal, within this small subset of 5% of California schools where only 6% of the kids are black, you, can pr you have to prioritize everybody who does the very worst on just one indicator. So look at chronic absenteeism. So you're, what this says is our equity multiplier is gonna narrow this conversation to be about everybody except Filipinos and Asians because everybody had very high chronic absenteeism, and that's the one indicator that qualifies within that very thin band of schools, extra attention. It's not on the basis of English language arts or math or suspension rates or graduation rates, things that most people would think to be important, but chronic absenteeism, which has fundamentally changed during the pandemic. Kids are staying home because we told them to. If you're symptomatic, stay home. 
people are still passing due to COVID. My father just died due to COVID at the end of last month. This is still an issue. So it's not a blip, chronic absenteeism. It's something that's gonna stay with us, which is why there's all these conversations going on in the state about changing the nature in which schools are funded, not based on average daily attendance. Let's go to the slide before, and I'm gonna, I'm over by two minutes, Madam Chair. In spite of what I just told you about, the advocates that are a part of the Black in School Coalition want to negotiate and have gone to the administration to negotiate. And we've said, okay, how about this alternative equity multiplier? And we sent this in a budget letter to all the chairs of the budget committees and to the entire legislature. And we said, okay, even though I don't believe that African Americans deserve less, we'll take the 300 million. We'll take the 300 million. And we will, and our language says, fund the lowest performing students, student groups, so we'll take your language of student groups below the state average on two or more state indicators on the California school dashboard. So we also say, we'll take your measurement, your multiple measures. But now let's go to the next slide. We'll see the end of the story, and then I'd love to entertain questions. If you look at the groups that have two or more indicators, the ones in the, that are below the state average, not rock bottom, but they're below the state average, that would mean foster youth. They're very low in ELA. They're very low in math, where the state is low. They're very high in suspension rates where the state is medium. But guess what? The state already funds them. They acknowledge them officially as high-need students. Students with disabilities, very low where the state is low in ELA, very low in math where the state is low. High uh, suspension rates when the state is medium. Uh, medium. Low graduation state uh, rates where the state is medium. But guess what? The federal government already funds them. Homeless, very low in math, where the state is low. High in suspension rates, where the state is medium. Low in graduation rates, where the state is medium. But guess what? The state already funds them. African Americans, very low in math, where the state is low. That's indicator one. High in suspensions, where the state is medium. That's indicator two. They would qualify for funding. Low in graduation rates where the state is medium. That's number three. The next group, but the state does not fund them. And according to the administration, they will not fund them because they won't have a policy that benefits blacks. That begins to sound in my ears like discrimination. If the entire legislature on a bipartisan basis passes the bill, but the administration stands in the, in the way, I gotta ask some questions about that. Especially if you raise it as a 14th Amendment issue to the US Constitution, that it's an equal protection issue to not fund black children's education because they're black. When the President of the United States has a White House initiative for black people, I mean, Joe don't play. <laughs> He said for black people. Okay, but let, let's set that aside. The other group that chronically underperforms, American, American Indian, their language, not mine, high in suspension rates when the state is medium, and low in graduation rates where the state is medium. So with this construct, let's go to the uh, slide before. The Black in School Coalition, which includes 16 civil rights organization and education advocates, are, are, have presented a proposal to the governor to say, 90% of these resources of the 300 million should go to the 81,000 unfunded black students generating 270 million a year, and also, can you go to the second slide? No, the third's there. 
This is our language, I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna stop. The important thing in, in school funding is that you be in the unduplicated pupil count because it qualifies you for other money. And during COVID, that was worth $7.8 billion. Funding doubles down and doubles down on funding if you're a part of the unduplicated pupil count because that's the way California says you're high needs. If you're not in that designation, then you're not high needs in the eyes of the state. So our language is this, fund any student group that receives performance levels worse than the state on two indicators or more state, on two or more state indicators on the California school dashboard. Only pupils in, this, in the, those student groups who do not receive other state or federal supplemental funding will receive this equity multiplier funding. Pupils funded pursuant to this section shall be deemed to be unduplicated pupils for the purposes of Education Code Section 4223007, which is the accountability provisions, and any other statutes for which resources are allocated based on unduplicated pupil counts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fortune. So it's now 341. Uh, I wanna be sensitive to time. There is another um, item on the agenda that's related to this topic, but I also wanna provide space if any task force members um, would like to ask any questions to our panelists or um, have any comments, uh, brief comments or questions. I'll come here. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized, and we'll go to Member Tamaki. I want to remind us that it was someone who wears our colors but didn't play on our team. Wardell Connolly, who put us in this mess. It didn't come from somebody from afar. The enemy came from within the family. That's what the presentation says. Langston Hughes was right. I swear to the Lord, I still can't see why democracy means everybody but me. And that's what this excellent Factual presentation brings right before our eyes, and I hope it sinks in our minds, our souls, and our bones. And we know again that in this nation, America is still on probation when it comes to paying for the crime that's been committed against our humanity. Well, I'd like to thank all the speakers and uh, Dr. Fortune, thank you for that great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I've been poring over the education proposals and it addresses the local control funding formula, but I think we need more input from you after looking at this. And among the issues that Pastor Brown just said is Prop 209. I mean, obviously this thing was created by hate and ra racism, and now you can't consider race to fix it. So <clears throat> basically in that local control funding formula, um, I, ne I need to better understand how the wording of what would appear in the final report goes through. So um, I'm gonna ask the Department of Justice and I could be part of that conversation to learn more about this. But it is addressed, but <clears throat> I'm not sure it's addressed in the way that you framed it. So I, I wanna make sure that we understand what you said. So, but thank you so much. Thank you, I'm happy to participate in those conversations, member Tamaki. Great, thank you. Um, I also want to uh, lift up Brandon Green, attorney, director of uh, ACLU Racial Justice Project, Northern California, uh, for a couple things. I mean, one, um, <clears throat> they were 
ACLU NorCal has been really tremendously helpful in helping us shape the, the uh, survey that we talked about earlier uh, this morning and um, help provide really good e expert input all along the way, thank you. And then uh, Brandon Green has helped uh, launch really uh, endorsements uh, from not only the ACLU, but organizations up and down the state, multiracial uh, endorsements of reparations in the task force in the interim report. And <clears throat> uh, Brandon Green's work was really important because people saw ACLU endorsing it, they wanted to get on board. So I really appreciate that, uh, Brandon, and your help on that. Thank you. Okay, so I have just some last kind of questions for a couple of folks. So for Jalen, I understand your point around um, lineage and the barriers. And so I was curious um, of your opinion, you know, with this proposed new state agency, uh, with the you know proposed Office of Genealogy, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily in existence um, in Rosewood. And so I'm curious about your opinions about the efficacy um, of that um, proposal. Um, if something like that was in existence in Florida, would that have alleviated any barriers? And then also keep in mind uh, the lineage criteria that the task force passed was uh, showing that you uh, have an ancestor who was living in the United States um, by 1900 or prior to 1900. Um, and then I also wanted Marilyn Van to, if you could just quickly elaborate, because I think that you kind of sped through on this particular point, um, drawing the parallels between you know, Indian freedmen and you know, African Americans who descend from slaves, uh, who are technically could be considered American freedmen, and um, what that could look like in terms of identifying us as a political stat class rather than a race or ethnicity, and what are the you know, government benefits that can come with that uh, positionality. Uh, Brandon, I wanted you to quickly point um, to any, um, your opinion about the role of CBOs with the proposed state agency. Uh, Professor Michaels, if you had any like uh, last comments that you wanted to raise, um, your, your written statement is incredibly comprehensive though, and I really appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness um, of your written statement. Um, and then I wanted to get to Kevin, if you wanted to sh um, just quickly elaborate around um, why you think African Americans are owed special consideration. Uh, so those are my kind of list of questions. So we'll go from like Jalen Van, really briefly, because we do have another um, segment. So Jalen Van, Brandon, Professor Michaels, and then Kevin. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think when my major point when we're talking about this idea of lineage, to answer the question directly, yes, I do believe um, that that entity, especially if it was implemented in Florida, would work. However, um, I think it's really important how critical we are in approaching this idea of lineage because of the fact that we understand that Black people across the nation, even across a given state, are in such different circumstances. And a lot of times those circumstances are a result or a direct result um, of the uh, of slavery, right, and of racism, and of Jim Crow resulting from that. And so, if we can acknowledge that we are in a state, or if we are in a place, a nation where there are some Black people who can't even access ten dollars to get meals for their children, right, and their families, how are they supposed to access certain documents, right? We look at people who uh, may have experienced homelessness, which we know is higher among these populations. What are they supposed to do? What documents are they supposed to get when we understand that there are Black people who are homeless now who don't even have access to a, a valid state ID? And again, we can argue that those situations and experiences that they are in are a direct result of slavery, um, of, green, uh, of redlining, and of a lot of practices that um, that came after, and so I always advocate um, a very, very intentional approach um, about how we are considering what lineage looks like. I'm able to establish lineage um, meeting certain criteria uh, on my dad's side, but I couldn't do that on my mom's side. My mom's side, right? And again, it's because of, as I acknowledged in my testimony, the privilege that I have to have Rosewood um, mentioned within certain textbooks and history books. So I always just advocate for that and really thinking about how are we reaching out to all of those members um, who have been impacted, uh, because those are the ones who are going to deserve it most, right? And so kind of looking beyond ourselves and, and, and what's really around us. And I hope that kind of touched on, on, on your question. Thank you. And Marilyn Van. 
All right. Okay, uh, Brandon? Sure. <clears throat> I think, um, you know, as a, as a lawyer who is a direct services lawyer at a, at a nonprofit and um, often works in, in coalition with uh, community-based organizations, I definitely think there's a, a role to be played. I think there's a role to be played in terms of, um, you know, the narrative, the lived experience. Um, you know, CBOs are often on the ground um, providing direct services. And, you know, a lot of these policies will have several different implementation um, phases, as Jalen was just talking about, in terms of um, helping people navigate the process and other things, while also uh, being able to seed um, ideas directly from the ground, some things that may or may not have been um, missed uh, by the, the task force, um, by virtue of people not having access um, in the same way that those of us who have testified um, have. Um, I think separate from that, though, that there are other things, changes uh, that need to be made um, along the governmental structure, uh, legal and policy structures um, that might not necessarily be the ideal place for um, community-based organizations, even though I think that those are places where uh, they would necessarily need to have the input from community-based organizations because, again, they're closest to the people on the ground um, and therefore closest to the solution. Thank you. Uh, Professor Michaels? Uh, thanks. I I just want to uh, touch back touch touch base on a couple of the determination and eligibility challenges that arise because I know a number of you have have a number of my pan, uh, colleagues on the panel have mentioned it and I, I think again it it really focuses on investment and outreach and I was I'm the I was the one preaching big government and we need to do this in house within the state but that doesn't mean the state can't partner with local businesses, with the teachers on the ground, with um, youth coaches to help gather people where they can help do some of the work, the genealogy work, all the eligibility determinations are going to be incredibly challenging. And it's going to lead not only to those with the most resources having the easiest access, but then in you know, kind of inter-beneficiary um, um, tension and frustration. And I think there needs to be kind of recognition that that's going to happen. And what are we going to do when there's a class of people? Again, Jalen Blocker just, again, was very um, candid about his own experiences and that we should learn from that. And he said from one side of his family, this isn't going to, he's not going to have to, this would not be a challenge. But from the other side, it, it would be a very big lift. So what do we do for the families who have basically both of the latter side? And how do we channel them into the program? There may be some things where there simply isn't going to be eligibility, but what else can we do for them? And that could be, let me connect you with other services. Let me help you participate in this program that doesn't have a bright line eligibility um, determination. And we can fold you in and we can lift you alongside of the folks who can easily check those boxes. Um, I don't have a quick kind of uh, administrative law fix to that. I think naming the problem, understanding it, and having a lot of recognition on the ground that when folks, folks should not be just turned away, but they should be redirected and help um, uh, uh, so they're not starting on by scratch on their own, but figure out where there can be community resources that can support them. Maybe there can be kind of, um, you know, again, libraries can be genealogy sources, schools can be sources of genealogy support, um, local towns can be more um, so, so, um, uh, willing to receive pretty challenging requests and help do some of the deep dives to look at deeds and records and all sorts of other stuff. So it is going to take uh, folks from outside of the state apparatus, but the state really needs to help kind of lead that charge and say, we're, we're looking to you as partners. So I, I just wanted to second everything that had been said and just underscore how difficult this is going to be. Thank you. And then lastly, Professor Brown. Uh, thank you for your, for your question. In closing, and especially after having listened to Dr. Fortune's presentation, uh, as well as the anti-CRT waiver legislation, which I've been trying to, to fight or one of the people fighting against it. I want to point out the greatest insight of critical race theory was the recognition that like slavery and segregation, race neutral or colorblind thinking can be a new form of oppression because it eliminates the color consciousness focus on attacking racial disparity 
And by doing so, it freezes into place the existing disparity. Thus, as an example that Dr. Fortune just gave us, defining the need of extra funding in terms of low-income students as opposed to low-performing students has such a dramatic negative impact on Black students, but represents race-neutral colorblind thinking. And the anti-CRT proponents are carrying this to the farthest extent by effectively arguing that pointing out the racial discrimination of whites in the past is a new form of discrimination because it requires you to talk about race. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Everyone, let's give them a great round of applause. We will now turn to agenda item number 10, implementation of potential recommendations. Continue, uh, we will hear from Chas Alamo, who is a principal fiscal and policy analyst at the California Legislative Analyst Office, which provides nonpartisan policy and budget guidance to the legislature. Good afternoon, um, Chair Moore and, and members of the task force. Again, my name is Chaz Alamo. I'm an analyst with the state's legislative analyst office here in Sacramento. Um, and the, the task force asked us to present at today's meeting about sort of several paths that could be possible um, for ultimate task force recommendations to flow through the legislature and become state law. Um, so we were also asked to pay particular attention to how this process could be applied for the creation of the, the new agency uh, that's included in the interim report recommendations. Um, but as an outline of my remarks, uh, I'll walk you through sort of the general legislative process, but then home in a bit on legislative processes that have been used to create or change state departments and agencies, because they're a little bit different. Um, and then provide a, a few sort of illustrative examples of recent reorganizations that might prove helpful um, for the task force as it thinks about sort of this bridge um, between the ultimate recommendations and those recommendations becoming state law. Um, but maybe first a bit of background on our office. The Legislative Analyst Office uh, provides nonpartisan policy and budget guidance to the state legislature, so to both houses and to both parties. Um, we counsel the legislature on fiscal issues, on sort of programmatic issues, and also on governmental organizational issues. Um, and so that's why I was asked today to present. Um, so stepping into the, the, the first section, just a, a brief overview of the state's legislative process. The, the sort of preliminary key thing that we wanted to point out, and as you all know, um, but it's worth reiterating, is that almost all of the interim or preliminary task force recommendations would require a new state law or changes to existing state law to go into effect. And so I, I, I mentioned this to sort of put weight on the, the importance of this bridge concept between the recommendations and the legislative process. Um, so sort of starting with a brief overview of the, the legislative process itself, um, it begins when a member decides to author a bill on a topic, um, in this case, uh, a bill to enact a task force recommendation. In that time, the, the member will share sort of details or an outline of the bill or the recommendation um, with the legislative council's office, uh, who are basically the, the legislature's attorneys. And the legislative council's office staff will turn those sort of broad ideas or, or um, sort of bullet points or the recommendation itself from the final report into statutory language, so the legislative language that would go into state law. Um, from there, the members will have this language in his or her hands and will be able to present it in uh, their house, so either in the assembly or in the Senate, at which time it gets a number, so your sort of AB 1378 assembly bill that would be, um, and it would be introduced on the floor in, in that house. Um, the first stop for a bill is with the Rules Committee in either the Assembly or the Senate, depending on where it was first introduced. And the Rules Committee determines sort of how to farm out the bill, um, and that is to which 
relevant policy committee that has jurisdiction over the issue will hear the bill in more detail. And so from the rules committee, a bill is, is um, sent to its relevant policy committee, and it will be heard during hearings at that policy committee. Um, during the policy committee process, I do want to sort of really emphasize that members of the public will be able to make comment. Um, other members of the legislature can ask questions about the bill um, and, and deliberate about the bill's uh, details and so on and so forth. In many cases, during the committee hearing process, bills are changed, um, known as amendments. And so you have this, this situation where a bill might be amended several times and have to be re scheduled for a committee hearing so the committee can hear the bill again in its newest iteration. Each of those times, the public would be able to comment on the bill. Um, once the bill passes by a vote of the committee, it would go to a vote of the full House, uh, the full membership of the House of Origin. When it passes uh, from the vote of the full House, the bill would move to the other chamber. So either to the Senate, if it's an assembly bill, or to the assembly, if it's a Senate bill. And this process sort of begins again in the other chamber. If in the other chamber, the bill is amended, which is not uncommon, those bills have to get kicked back, or those changes, excuse me, would get kicked back to, to the house of origin where the changes would be either adopted or rejected. Um, ultimately through this process, if both houses, typically with a majority of vote, approve the bill on the house, so the full membership of, of the houses um, voting, then that bill would go to the governor's desk. Um, at the governor's desk, the governor has three options to sign the bill into law, um, to allow the bill to become law without his signature or to veto the bill. Um, and a veto bill, as you all know, but just to reiterate, can be overturned by a two thirds vote of both um, houses of the legislature. Um, so that's sort of the, the very high level description of the state's legislative process. And here I wanna kind of take that and translate it into a more specific process related technically to the creation of a new state agency, in this case, the, the Freedman Affairs Agency. Um, the creation and reorganization of state government is a little nuanced, and so there are some distinct differences to the regular legislative process that I wanted to point out through a couple of pathways, as I call them. Um, and each of these paths have been used recently, so I'll be able to share some examples. So customarily, or most typically, or normally, the most common way that state entities are reorganized or changed or created is through the executive branch reorganization process. Um, and this is a process that was granted to the governor by the legislature and is actually part of state the state constitution um, because the, the governor in essence has purview over the executive branch. So it was deemed first and foremost, the governor's responsibility to determine how best to manage the executive branch departments and agencies. Um, and under this process, the governor submits a plan for independent review. During that independent review, um, public comment is, is allowed and deliberation takes place. From there, the, the, the plan then goes to the relevant policy committees of the legislature and ultimately to an up or down vote by both houses of the legislature. Um, amendments are not allowed as part of the executive branch reorganization process. Um, this process was used most recently in 2012 when Governor Brown proposed to sort of reorganize and restructure uh, many state departments into three new state agencies. Um, that was the Transportation Agency, the Government Operations Agency, and the Business and Consumer Services Agency. Um, the next pathway, as, I, as I've mentioned, through which the, the agency could be created is what's known as budget trailer bill legislation. Um, and budget trailer bill, bear with me here, is basically um, a, a state law that is closely related to implementing the state budget. So they're sort of connected in a way. Um, and these bills are usually proposed by the governor and negotiated as part of the annual budget process. Um, the example I wanna highlight here comes from 2019, when the governor proposed to move the division of juvenile justice out from within um, CDCR and into the state's health and human services agency. So that was a, a departmental relocation. 
And that process uh, went through the budget trailer bill process and was adopted as part of the 2019-20 Budget Act. Um, the, the third and final pathway that I wanted to highlight is, is a bit of a hybrid approach. And this is an approach where the new agency could sort of be legislatively implemented through two parallel paths. And on the one hand, you could have the policy details, the programmatic responsibilities, um, and the organizational structure of the agency embedded in a policy bill, sort of a normal legislative bill. That would go to the relevant policy committee as sort of through the process that I described at the outset. Um, but at the same time, you would have a budget trailer bill that includes the, the, the fiscal components of, of the, the, um, the creation of the new agency. And the, the key distinction here is that a hybrid approach as, such as this likely would result in a case where the policy bill itself would not end up going through the state's, um, uh, the, the appropriation committees in, in either house. Um, and I should, should mention that typically, in addition to the relevant policy committee that a bill has um, sort of relation to, if the bill has a fiscal effect um, or requires spending, which of course a new affairs agency, um, Freedman Affairs Agency would, would necessitate, um, those bills also are required to go through the Appropriations Committee, which is responsible for spending. But under the hybrid approach, where budget trailer bill and a policy bill are used together, um, the, the policy bill may not need to go through the Appropriations Committee. Um, sort of stepping back a bit, sort of key takeaways as, as our office sees the creation of a new agency, it's first and foremost that the task force recommendations um, most of them will need new state law or changes to existing state law to, to go into effect. Um, that said, there are several processes that have been used in the last 10 years to create new entities or change agencies. Um, so there are some options available, obviously, to the task force and to members of the legislature to implement the recommendations. Um, each path includes several opportunities for public comment and deliberation. And a key point here I do, I do want to stress is that those deliberations by a, among members of the legislature could result in changes to the task force recommendations. Um, those amendments uh, could result in, a, in an outcome where the task force recommendation differs from, from what becomes state law. Um, a, a quick note on timing. The task force final recommendations uh, could be first introduced in the legislature um, come this December. And despite an early introduction in December after the legislative recess, those bills would not be heard in their policy committees until March or April of next year. Um, so I thought that might be important sort of logistical context for, for the, the, the task force. Um, and finally, typically, Reorganizations such as this or, or the creation of a new agency would be initiated through the, the governor's executive branch reorganization process, but other options exist. Um, and that regardless of the path that's used to, to initiate a new agency or to enact any of the recommendations that need changes to state law, Fundamentally, both houses of the state legislature will have to approve that action and the governor will have to sign it in order for it to become law. I'm happy to, to take any questions that the task force members may have. Uh, if I can answer them, excellent. If I can't, uh, our office will go to work and, and try to get you answers to the task force as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alamo, for your comprehensive expert testimony. Are there any comments? questions at this time, my fellow colleagues. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Alamo, again, for your expert testimony. We really appreciate it. Chair Moore, if I may. Sure. Uh, just uh, before we, before he, he leaves the line, uh, just to, you know, let the task force know. So one of the major decisions that will need to be made tomorrow um, in order to give the Department of Justice direction on some issues like the Freedmen's Bureau or other uh, matters in terms of implementation, 
you know, tomorrow will, ha will be the vote, sort of a vote as to how to do this, how to approach this and what the scope of the Bureau should be and how the, how things should be, how the task force is gonna recommend items be implemented uh, in the final recommendation. So to the extent you might have any questions about how anything is implemented, you know, whether things should be consolidated or spread out across other agencies with a different kind of um, entity sort of making sure it's happening, uh, this is, you know, the expert on that kind of implementation. So if you have any questions on those, I know we've, we've gotten a lot of them and I know we've had a lot of discussion in previous meetings on that. In light of that, are there any other additional comments or questions? Uh, Member Groves, you're recognized. Um, so thank you, Mr. Alamo. I had a question about commissions in relationship to what you've been describing with state agencies. Um, to what extent is it easy or difficult to establish an oversight commission type body? And do these bodies have the authority or the ability to truly impact state agencies? To be candid, I think the answer is, is will really depend on the circumstances of the, the, the oversight commission. Um, there are obviously dozens of instances in state government where, where we have this type of relationship and they operate or function differently in each case. Um, so it's difficult to, to paint a, a broad brush, so to speak. Um, I will say to your first question, um, the creation of a commission or an, or an oversight entity would be in many instances simpler and likely require fewer state financial resources than the creation of an agency per se, only because a commission is, is going to be stabbed by a smaller number of, of employees um, and probably just logistically simpler to, to put together. Um, but that's a, a logistics question more than anything else. Um, I recognize that this question was deliberated at length at the last series of meetings. And our impressions as an office really boil down to, to that there are pros and cons to the approach, any approach that, that the task force puts forward as part of its recommendation. And that is, you know, specifically whether to consolidate all of these efforts under one agency um, or to try to attempt to distribute some of these responsibilities among existing state entities. Um, there will be opportunities to take advantage of other state departments that are doing much of much similar work functionally. Um, and maybe that plays to the favor of distributing the tasks. On the other hand, um, a, a sole agency, as was mentioned during the last hearing uh, last month, um, you know, would be more high profile in nature, would be a cabinet level appointment. Um, and so responsibilities and accountability would be consolidated in that fashion. Um, it's not to say that there's a right or wrong path forward, um, but that I think from my testimony, what I would hope to impart is that wherever it is the task force recommendation ultimately leads tomorrow, there will be additional deliberation, expert um, consultations, public testimony um, between sort of when the task force recommendation is made and when the state law is is ultimately enacted that will allow for some of these for details to be to be worked out in in the way that you know is most effective for the state and and for these purposes any other comments questions member john sawyer you're recognized and then member bradford yeah and and, and maybe we we can unpack this in a way where it, a little more clarification and maybe we can do it by by example uh, what I mean by um, we have the Public Utilities Commission which sets our rates for our gas and electricity which 
can sometimes be a, a burden, sometimes can be a help. But they have, from what I understand, they have the ability to raise your rates up and down across the state, and they don't necessarily have to come back to the, the assembly to get buy-off or approval. Or, or you have a commission like the, the Cannabis Commission, which may work with a department specifically um, to regulate cannabis statewide through a department. And so I, I think it might be good to talk about the distinctions about the, what they can and can't do once they're implemented, because I think that's where we're trying to get to so that people have a clear understanding. Because from what I'm hearing from individuals who are coming here, I don't want them to get the misunderstanding that um, uh, an entity can possibly, and it may be an entity that does that, that can go across different departments and order them to do something or have them um, or have them change codes, regulations, administrative duties, um, and have that kind of authority. And, and it may be an entity like that, but as far as I know, there isn't one like that. Most of these commissions, uh, I guess, are almost like what we are, advisory in, in a lot of ways. Um, and to get something to the level of a PUC or the, um, the other one that has a, a lot of uh, authority is the, uh, the UC trustees. They have immense power, 12-year terms, and uh, the legislature tries to get them to do certain things, and we, for the most part, to the consternation of a lot of assembly members and the governor, they, they're almost autonomous, and uh, they have total record, they totally have responsibility for the UCs and make, and actually decide tuition and everything. So uh, can you kind of talk about all the different types of commissions that you could possibly have and what to what it will take and what to expect because I would imagine if you try to start a a PUC or a UC type of commission that's a high I don't know if that's a constitutional level where we got to go to the people to, as opposed to administratively being done thank you assembly member for for pointing out the key distinction to be made um my comments were specific to sort of your your latter example um being a, a smaller commission that acts as an advisory board performing some oversight duties of a related department or agency rather than um, your first example puc or the the uc that is independent in nature um the i i my understanding was that the question related to to a, a sort of administrative body that that oversees and provides guidance to a department um but forgive me if i misunderstood the question can you clarify when you say commission you're talking about an oversight body distinguishing that from a more fully comprehensive agency that would be more independent in nature right so when we talk about commission are you saying that's the oversight type of body that would work with um you know, existing state agencies versus, you know, a, a, a new entity agency with more independent broad-based power. Just need some clarity on that. Um, potentially. Um, that is one possible avenue for, for the task force going forward. Um, there are instances when in state government, it, it can be advantageous to have a, an advisory body of some kind, whether it's called a commission or otherwise, that um, the, works together with, but independently from the entity doing the programmatic implementation. Um, I think one of the, the previous panelists, expert panelists brought up uh, an example of that. Perhaps as an instance where, where that could be a, a, a useful model. Um, I can't say that our office has done enough evaluating of, of the interim report or the landscape to, to make a recommendation one way or the other on that, Chair. Sure. And a quick clarifying question with this um, idea of an oversight commission, uh, would it still be initiated, have to be initiated through the governor's office, or that's just reserved for the, you know, creation of a new agency? There's clarity on that as well. I can't think of 
an example where the govern the executive branch reorganization process has been used to create uh, a specific standalone commission. Um, I and I also don't believe that a commission couldn't cr be created uh, through through the other two legislative processes that I laid out in the testimonies or your normal legislative uh, processes. I think that the same sort of legislative pathways would apply to a commission or an agency um, as being proposed in the, the interim recommendations or both together. Thank you. Um, my questions and concerns are pretty much along the same lines as Assemblyman Jones Sawyer, and I'm just a little troubled that all that's involved here to have a recommendation tomorrow that is extremely complicated as it relates to making its way through the legislative process as the analyst has just shared. So I'm just wondering how much detail will we need to provide tomorrow in order to go forward or is this still a work in progress as we kind of shape it going forward because uh, it, it might take multiple pieces of legislation to achieve the ultimate goal and I just don't want to leave here tomorrow thinking that we've solved the problem. Um, in Oh, so was that a question to me or was... Your mic. <laughs> the basic thing is, is this going to just become a paralysis of an analysis? That's it. That's the bottom line. For us to spend all of these hours, then we get at an impasse as to who is going to bail the cat. That's it. And this goes for this audience out there, too. You're giving great verbiage, eloquent statements. But at the end of the day, we still have miles to go and promises to keep before we fall asleep. If anything's going to become a reality and meaningful, significant change in the lives of black folk in the state of California. I'm still ready to fight at 8 and 2. And with the, with the time that the Lord leaves me with here, but we're going to have to fight. And as Frederick Douglass said, it's a struggle. And since this is in Lent season, remember those of you who are believers, the devil only left Jesus for a season. We got some more seasons to deal with before we get to victory. Attorney Newman, did you have a comment? Absolutely, and I, I completely understand. Um, for in terms of tomorrow, we certainly are not um, planning to, you know, kind of get into the micro details of what a proposal may be. What we really need is just direction, you know, from the task force by a vote of how generally you want the draft composed. Our next meeting will be presenting the draft of the final report, and in that draft, you know, we'll need to know the sense of the task force and the task force's direction as to whether or not there should be a separate bureau, whether the recommendation is that there should be a separate bureau that is created, a, a new entity um, that is created and mandated to carry out um, the task force's you know, recommendations, or whether there, that should be allocated to the various agencies with a Freedmen's Bureau that has responsibility of seeing that it is all carried out or some other format of that. I don't necessarily think we need you know, exceeding details, but we need the direction between those two options so that we can then work that into the final recommendations that we'll be presenting at the next meeting. 
question for uh, Mr. Alamo. Uh, under the idea of, for instance, like an oversight commission or body, can you speak to um, any limitations, if any, uh, for this proposed oversight commission or body when it comes to ongoing lobbying or uh, policy making? Are there are they limited in that in in those ways in terms of? Uh, lobbying, let's say there's, um, you know, future issues that might um, come up that may not necessarily, uh, you know, be in the final report per se, you know, would an oversight commission be kind of limited um, in the types of things that it can do is the, is the, is the question. Of course. Um, I think the, the important perspective to take with thinking about an oversight commission in, in this respect is that the limitations or lack of limitations that, that you've mentioned can be determined uh, either as part of the task force recommendation, though that would be very specific, or ultimately as part of the state law that creates the entity. Um, so there, again, to, to reiterate, there are processes and opportunities sort of at various junctures between when the final recommendation is made and when, when uh, as the 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 bills or, or bill is moving through the legislature to make some of these more specific determinations about the role of either the commission or, or a, a full agency, um, the details and specifics uh, at, a, at a later date rather than having to determine them now. Um, it's difficult to answer the question specifically because um, you know it's, it's, it's still a commission or an agency that's in sort of idea form. And so these specific details haven't been enacted in state law, um, but that means that the opportunity to do so is is still before us. Follow up question. Uh, so uh, one of the expert uh, witnesses that spoke uh, talked about the idea of a two agency model and brought up the idea, for instance, the California Commission on Aging, you know, which serves as a principal advocate in the state for older individuals, while the Department of Aging, you know, administers programs uh, for older adults. And so, I mean, can you speak to um, I don't know the commonality of a two agency approach? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if this is, goes again, goes above kind of your purview of how, why you're here today, um, but any insight on um, how that could apply to what we're doing? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't speak, you know, in a really helpful way about that question, uh, in part because it's a, a bit outside of the, the scope of, of my testimony, but also I'm not familiar with either the Commission or the Department on Aging, um, uh, you know, beyond that they exist and that that's generally their relationship. Um, our office, uh, I'm happy to work with my counterparts who know more about that relationship um, to get back to you and, and the rest of the task force with additional information. Um, but I can't answer anything specific, I'm sorry. I think the last question for me, um, which might be helpful is you could just summarize what, um, you know, the, 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 the distinctions between, I think what I'm hearing is the creation of a new state agency um, versus simply an oversight body or commission. You know, again, um, I think the distinctions were well summarized in during the deliberations of the last task force meeting. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, a, an individual new agency responsibility uh, with responsibilities through the various branches for all of the programmatic areas delineated in the preliminary recommendation. Um, you know, some of the key benefits of that structure uh, would be sort of an, an issue of accountability. Um, all of the responsibilities are housed in one agency. Um, Coordination, of course, could be uh, more uniform with one agency. It would be a cabinet level post as proposed in the preliminary recommendation. Um, on the other hand, a, a more distributed uh, sort of commission that works across state government. Um, some of the benefits of that approach might be the opportunity to find instances where a state entity is, is doing something functionally similar um, uh, to whatever the, the branch or effort of, of the Freedmen's Bureau would have been and can take advantage of the expertise that that state entity already has. Um, Again, I, I do want to say with, with summarizing the, the two approaches, 
our office has no specific recommendation that one is better than the other. Um, I think there are ultimately trade-offs and and that's a, a decision you know for for the task force itself. And then one last follow-up question around the idea of a new state agency. Are you saying that a new state agency would not work with existing state agencies? And if if that's not what you're saying, can you kind of elaborate on the potential relationship uh, between a new state agency and existing state agencies? Of, of course. Um, as a cabinet level position, obviously uh, the, the executive branch is going to work with the new agency to coordinate across state government, I would presume. Um, so I, 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 I did not intend to give the impression that the, uh, 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 the Freedmen's Bureau would be sort of acting alone without collaboration with other state groups, um, rather that maybe in execution of some of the programmatic functions listed in the preliminary um, recommendations that those um, the implementation of those actions would be housed in the agency rather than at another state department that perhaps has some experience with a similar function. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Alamo. Uh, thank you. So the next item on our agenda is um, an update from Charles Communications Group in the Communications Advisory Committee. Good afternoon. Uh, ready? All right, first of all, thank you guys so much for having us. Um, as you know, we've been on this project about four months, and we are doing everything we can to get the communications out, not just in California, but across the nation. We have some really good things going on and teed up. We just have to take them to execution. So going to give you an overall um, briefing of what we've done pretty much in the last month since we've had the last task force meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the things that we have done um, is that we have been booking and coordinating media interviews for the task force members. We have been pushing out information about the work that the task force is doing as well as fielding any uh, requests from media that comes in. We've also been conducting, as you know, we've done the uh, media outreach for this hearing here for participation so that people know what is going on and that they can be included. We've also done some media coaching and messaging as well as talking points for the task force to make sure that we are sharing a similar message. I mean, it is nine task force members who all have thoughts, opinions, and feelings, but the goal is to make sure that everyone has uh, similar uh, messaging if they choose to use it. We've also delivered the long and the short version of the interim report uh, PowerPoint that I know some task force members have already used. We have also used it and we shared it actually with the mayor of Sacramento. We met with his office as well as um, we have been conducting briefings with the governor's office just to give them an update on the comm strategy and to see if they have any issues with any communication that is out there so we can do whatever is asked of us to make sure uh, we are combat combating any misinformation or any information that the governor's office potentially thinks is important to be addressed. Next slide, please. We've also launched the social media program and calendar. Uh, we do take input from task force members of uh, things they would like to see uplifted in the social media. So we try to plan that out in advance. And we are trying to make sure we do at least two to three social media posts per week, along with the additional work. Next slide, please. We also uh, 
We also did a uh, commercial in both Sacramento and Los Angeles, uplifting the task force meetings. Um, and so we are actually, I know some of the task force members uh, have not heard it. I know that the uh, community, the uh, committee has. And so we actually are gonna play it today so you have an idea of what was put out um, in the community. Did you know California has the first in the nation task force to study reparations for African Americans? This is a big deal, so listen up. The work of the task force is to examine and recommend to the state legislature potential remedies of compensation, rehabilitation, and restitution for African Americans with a special consideration for the descendants of persons enslaved right here in the United States. You should also know the task force has been hosting public hearings across the state to create awareness and to educate us. This is going to be a huge opportunity for us to participate because history matters. Join us for the next Reparations Task Force meeting, public comment edition from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Friday and Saturday, March 3rd and 4th, in the California Environmental Protection Agency's Byron Shear Auditorium, located at 1001 I Street in Sacramento. If you'd like more information, visit the California Department of Justice website at oag.ca.gov. That's oag.ca.gov or send an email to reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. So, so um, we also uh, partnered with the California Black Media and the Ethnic Media Services Group with the Secretary of State as well as Task Force Member Joan Sawyer and Tamaki. We did a media briefing with over 80 plus uh, ethnic media and that media briefing was also translated in Spanish, Korean and Mandarin. We also uh, worked with the uh, Baptist Ministers Conference and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, to put on a event um, for the black clergy to share what uh, the task force is doing, reparations, and then just have a conversation around reparations. So looking forward, of course, we are and have been in talks with the ACLU to help support the public awareness campaign. So we are right now just in the um, initiation part of that project. We will continue to coordinate and manage media opportunities as well as continue to provide social media assets. Uh, we are also uh, talking to and wanting to collaborate with other community organizations so that they can be the extension and the arms to help uh, support our comm strategy. And then, of course, uh, to support the task force members and update any documents as needed or as requested that uh, our resources can provide. Lastly, uh, I want to say thank you. And uh, thank you to the organizations that have reached out, to the organizations that have stepped up, to the organizations that have been willing to support us to support our comm strategy, our social media strategy. And I also want to thank the reporters, the reporters in this room, who have really helped us on this mission, who listened to me call them over to pitch ideas and to pitch stories and to pitch task force members for particular stories and particular media. And so I'm very, very grateful because this is not a task that we can do alone. This is a task where we need all of you. We need your help. We need the task force members' help. We need the media's help. And so I want to let them know today that I'm grateful and I'm thankful to the organizations and I'm thankful to them for helping to tell the stories and the ones who don't do the mismessaging or helping us combat any mismessaging or disinformation. So with that, um, my last uh, video here is a video of the event that we did in collaboration with the Baptist Ministers Conference and SCLC, and I hope you enjoy, and we plan on doing more, so thank you. I'm Amos C. Brown, Vice Chair of the California State Reparations Task Force. Needs to be a part of an endeavor to ensure that there will be a sensible, substantive, and significant reparations package presented to this State Assembly and Senate that will be for the common good of African Americans who have been wronged and harmed in the state of California. 
the reason why we have to fight for reparations, what our people went through. Jen, I think the conversation today is what's the church's role in all of this conversation? And how do we go back to our churches to amplify this conversation? No church member should be questioning the rightness and the office for reparations. I'm going to spread reparation. I am going to tip, educate my community. I'm going to educate my church. I'm going to live the life. I'm going to open my doors. I'm going to walk and I'm going to speak because there's a fight for us. We built this nation. We built the Congress. We built the White House. We built the Levin. But everybody else has gotten reparations but us. Uh, and we've been conditioned to just accept it to be what it is. One of our steps towards reparation is going to be at the ballot. Folk who have built and paid for homes in communities like Windsor Hills and Ladera, and their kids are losing it over property taxes. Reparations, yes. Give us what belongs to us. But while we're waiting on it, we got to teach people how to prepare for it. What we're doing in California now is a first major stride, but we can't blow it by being divided. It's clear that America is not against reparations. They're just against reparations for black people. If there are questions in this room about reparations, I want to encourage you to go to Ghana and walk through slave those slave castles. Being on those sacred grounds will cause you to rethink how you think about black folk in America. And that's the foundation for reparation. Is that you have been informed, enlightened, that you got the call to action, that you understand what's happening. Any questions, comments uh, for the communications firm before we go to the next agenda item? Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. I must say, in spite of the rain that came, it was significant that a large number of clergy persons were in attendance, and they were very much engaged, excited, and uh, empowered to carry the word about great work that this task force is doing. So can folks go to the SELC website for the video or? No, I have the video and I just have to decide where we can have it housed since there is not a um, website for the uh, task force. But um, I can share it. You guys can share it out. I can share it with the organization. So uh, please, you know, do us that favor and actually share it. It's, it's good information. Thank you so much. Uh, any comments? No, if you can get it to me and, and several other members, because I definitely want to push that out. Um, um, I got chills watching Reverend Brown speak. So I, I, I think as an ambassador for us, uh, we all need to push this out because it's um, rather inspirational. So, so thank you for doing this. You're welcome. I will send it out to the anchor orgs, absolutely. Send it to the anchor orgs, too. And uh, if there are any organizations in here, and I'm sorry my back is turned, if you are looking for a task member to be on a panel, please reach out um, and we will do our best permitting their time and respecting the other work that they have to see if we can collaborate and do some work, okay? Thank you for the work you're doing. The only comment I have, I don't think all task force members have received the talking points or the short and long term PowerPoints that you mentioned. So, um, can you please make sure that all task force members receive those documents? Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, everyone, let's give a hand to our communications firm. The next item on our agenda is agenda item number 12, local municipal reparation efforts. Uh, we will be hearing from the city of Richmond. Uh, we'll hear from Dimless Johnson III, 
Dimless Johnson III was born at Brookside Hospital and grew up in the Iron Triangle. After graduating from Howard University, he returned to Richmond to serve his community. In the 2000, in 2018 election cycle, he made history by becoming the youngest person ever. Oh, I'm introducing uh, Dimless Johnson, uh, who in the 2018 election cycle, he made history by becoming the youngest person ever elected to the Richmond City Council. Before becoming a council person, he served as chair of Richmond's Economic Development Commission and as a member of the Community Police Review Commission. As an elected official, he worked to renew communities without leaving behind those who make it special. As a community worker at Richmond High School, he partnered with groups across the city to help our youth succeed academically and socially. He is currently working on a number of initiatives in the city of Richmond and uh, the California Policy Government Relation Manager at Jumpstart for Young Children Incorporated. Uh, we'll also hear from Trina Jackson Lincoln, who is a city council liaison and project coordinator for Richmond. She joined the city of Richmond team in 1995 as an admin aide in the city manager's office. During her tenure, she has supported the city council, assisted members of the public to navigate municipal government, facilitated community events, and managed the office of Richmond City Council. She is the team lead of the Richmond Race Equity Team and Staff Liaison for the Sister City Program, the Youth Council, and the Richmond AC Transit Interagency Liaison Committee. As a native of Richmond, Mrs. Jackson Lincoln attended the Richmond schools and obtained associate's degree in political science and social and behavioral science from Contra Costa College and a Bachelor of Arts in Human Development from California State University, East Bay. Lastly, we'll hear from LaShonda White. LaShonda White has over 16 years of experience working with the city of Richmond, her hometown, and currently serves as the deputy city manager over community services and leads the Richmond Department of Children and Youth. Ms. White has developed and managed various grant programs providing millions in funding to local organizations, managed consultants to conduct community needs assessments and strategic investment plans, and worked on special projects. Furthermore, LaShonda has just demonstrated a commitment to equity, the underserved, and those who feel marginalized with her service uh, with Richmond's Government Alliance on Racial Equity Team and Richmond's Rapid Response Fund, helping those negatively impacted by COVID. Prior to her work with the city of Richmond, Ms. White has experience working at the nonprofit state and federal levels, having matriculated from the University of California at Berkeley with both her Bachelor of Science and Master of Public Policy. She is proud to work with and for the residents of Richmond. Finally, Ms. White is a wife and a mother to two beautiful daughters and a singing husky named Skye. So now we'll hear from Mr. Johnson, uh, Ms. Trina Jackson Lincoln, and Mrs. White. Thank you all for coming, and you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, Task Force members, DOJ, IT, and other present staff. Before we begin, I'd like to lift up and honor Callie House, Queen Mother Moore, the late Representative John Kyers, and Cobra, CJAC, ARCC, Reparations Now, and other organizations, cities, and counties doing this reparations work. The primary goal of this reparations package was to adopt policy recommendations, consider CBO partnerships, as well as redesign current city programs with a reparations lens to establish a, rip a Richmond reparations program and begin to address the challenges facing African Americans in Richmond. The goal, of the, implement, the goal of the local reparations package will help African American community, and over the past few years, the city of Richmond has passed several ordinances solidifying its status as a sanctuary city. By implementing these reparations programs, the city will be keeping with this moniker as a restorative and social justice city. However, given the restrictions of Prop 209, we had to get a little creative about how we were going to achieve this. Next slide, please. Here is a brief overview of what we'll be discussing this afternoon. Um, history and research, housing and land, procurement, business development, cultural reparations, investments in people, race and equity officer, as well as the race equity action plan um, created by the Government Alliance of Racial Equity, also known as GARE. Next slide, please. Brief 
little history of the city of Richmond. I know some folks probably saw the movie Coach Carter, but we're a little bit more than that. Um, in 1940, the African American population was only 270 people. But by 1943, the African American population grew to over 5,000 people. In this, and by 1947, over 13,000 people. Over the course of seven years, the African American population in Richmond grew 5,000%. This increase was due to the opening of the Kaiser shipyards where gender and race discrimination was not allowed to keep people from employment. Also, the lack of Jim Crow laws in California made the state ideal for black Southerners. Even after the war ended, African Americans continued to migrate to Richmond. By 1970, the African American population made up 36% of the overall population. However, today, the African American population is declining. Many African American families lost their homes in the Great Recession due to predatory lending practices and evictions. The rise in housing costs has forced many black Richmond residents to East Contra Costa County in cities like Pittsburgh and Antioch. In addition to the Great Recession, years of redlining has contributed to the disinvestment of certain communities. The construction of Hilltop Mall contributed to the decline of black business districts along McDonald Avenue and not to mention the impact of the crack epidemic, war on drugs, and mass incarceration's impact on the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. So first to start off, um, some of the recommendations in housing and land reparations, as you can see from the picture, a lot of it was inspired by what took place in Evanston, Illinois. Um, we're currently um, talking about giving $25,000 um, grants to descendants of um, slavery as well as redlining for down payment, loan payoff, upgrades, closing costs, and et cetera. We've currently been in discussion with a community-based organization who's already doing this work. Um, and so we wanna continue to help fund that program so that way individuals won't have to pay back the loan. It can actually be a grant program. Next, we discussed um, a direct receivership program to low and moder moderate income. During the subprime mortgage crisis, three million homes went vacant. In 2018, the city of Richmond had 250 vacant homes and each was posing a serious fire risk to the city. To address the issue, the Department of Infrastructure, Maintenance and Operation is looking to acquire homes through a receivership program. The program will follow a legal process where the title of vacant property is temporarily taken from non-compliant owners and sold to buyers. The recommendation was for the, was for the city of Richmond to make sure people who descendants, um, black descendants had access to these properties. As a bonus, this, we've even discussed subsidizing construction um, with our local Richmond Build program. In addition, the right to return policy for former residents um, from certain low income census tracts, and then the Richmond Homestead Ordinance. As we all know, the Homestead um, Act in the past did not benefit African Americans. Um, and with the new mandate from the state government asking all cities and counties to take stock of all um, surplus property, what, we're proposed, what I proposed was for the city to allow local residents and business owners, black local residents and business owners, to have first access to these properties. Next slide, please. Procurement. Municipalities and states with race-neutral procurement policies are engaging prime contractors at the bidding phase to develop procurement plans. Also, they're developing inclusive procurement across sectors and proactively engaging the private sector. And what, I'm asking, and what, we, what I requested of our city manager um, with the Richmond Business Opportunity Ordinance is to have sheltered bidding aside for black businesses. And then creating a guaranteed um, program for bonding which would create a list of guaranteed co-signers so black-owned so black businesses can get bonding. Next slide, please. Under business development, the city currently has a facade improvement program um, where, we, where there's funds distributed to local businesses um, to help improve the facade of their businesses. And so the proposal was to redesign this program with the reparations um, lens so that way black business owners as well as descendants of American slavery will have access, greater access to this um, program as well. And then the cannabis equity ordinance. As I mentioned in my opening, the war on drugs significantly impact the city of Richmond and our residents and our population. 
Um, the cannabis equity ordinance that we're currently working on will do set-asides in both the delivery, storefront, and cultivation businesses for African Americans who were directly impacted by mass incarceration as a result of the war on drugs. Next slide, please. Cultural reparations. Developing a cultural district, an African American cultural district that will help the city reflect on the, on the heritage and the contributions of African Americans. In addition to that, passing, next slide please. Sorry. In addition to that, passing a resolution acknowledging the, the racism and wrongdoings of the past, um, slight work, and then establishing a permanent African American history museum um, for the city of Richmond. Establishing heritage trails throughout the city, highlighting different places and events that took place in the city of Richmond um, because of African American achievement. And then including a black art aspect in the existing art tax. When developers come to the city of Richmond, they either have to build uh, some type of art monument or they have to contribute to a fund. And what, we're, what I proposed was for there to be a specific fund for black art to be increased throughout the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. Investments in people. We can't do this without investing in folks, right? So we've been talking with the Richmond Rapid Response Fund for a guaranteed income program, which would be a public-private partnership. So that way, primarily African-American mothers will have access. So far, we're talking about a pilot program with 50 black mothers to receive guaranteed income monthly. And then um, having formerly incarcerated persons as a protected class which will prevent discrimination in, in housing, employment, and public accommodations for those who are formerly incarcerated. And then partnering with the Richmond Community Foundation on their Black Women and Girls Task Force. And this task force is meant to cover everything from the infant mortality rate and its disproportional impact on Black women and children, as well as the pay gap in Black women entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. Infrastructure. We've had a lot of disinvestment in black communities in terms of infrastructure. Um, and so we, you know, we talking about creating a water equity plan with our um, Department of Maintenance. Water equity is about giving everyone the opportunity to participate in prosper in water. There are three pillars which include access to safe, clean, and affordable water, wastewater services, a share in economic, social, and environmental benefits of water and resiliency in the face of floods, droughts, and other climate risk. Our unincorporated area of North Richmond is in, flood, is in a flood zone. Um, and then also the, equity, the water equity plan is to ensure that Richmond does not become the next Flint or Jackson, Mississippi. Adopting a pavement equity plan for black communities. And as mentioned earlier, because we have um, a decline in African American um, population, we don't have predominantly African American communities. We have historically African American communities where a majority of our black population live. And as I mentioned, there's been a historical disinvestment in the streets and roads in sidewalks and even ADA compliance in those communities. And so creating a plan that disrupts the AI system that most um, government bodies use to make sure that black community streets are paved and that sidewalks are also um, safe. The city also has a sewer lateral program um, which helps homeowners and so the plan is to um, redesign that program with the reparations lens so that way black homeowners can have an opportunity to upgrade their properties. Next slide, please. So before I pass it off to my, my colleagues, um, some of the other recommendations that were made were in participatory government, making sure that we had a, we, Rick, the city of Richmond recently moved into, major, moved into district, vote, district voting and away from citywide. And so the recommendation was to create as many black majority voting districts as possible. Now I'd like to pass it off to my colleague, Ms. Trina Jackson Lee, to talk about the city's government alliance on race and equity, also known as the Garretine. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. I'm Trina Jackson Lincoln. I'm the city council liaison and project coordinator. The city of Richmond joined the government alliance on race and equity in 2016. GARE is a joint project of Race Forward and the Othering and Belonging Institute. There are over 200 jurisdictions across the nation that have joined the network. Our small team of eight employees from various departments participated in a learning cohort in 2017. 
One of our major assignments during this cohort was to develop a race equity action plan that consisted of four overarching goals and we put together seven to 10 action items for each of these goals that would help us assist, well, that would help us with achieving said goals. Our team has presented the action plan at over 20 different occasions via lunch and learn sessions for employees, community forums, and presentations to the city council, and also workshops. During these forums, the action items were presented to participants who were asked to identify their top three action items, and that's how we were able to prioritize. Next slide, please. The first goal is that the City of Richmond employees understand and are committed to achieving race equity. The top three action items were meet with department directors, establish a citywide training program for employees and community partners consisting of race equity, implicit bias, structural and institutional racism, and use of a racial equity tool with policies and programs. We wanna support employee learning. Training will help execute excuse me, training will help executive and line staff to increase cultural competency, understand the importance of equitable outcomes, and equip them to be mindful of race equity in policies and programming. Next slide, please. Ultimately, we would like to develop a train the trainer method. Over the years, we have contracted with Race Forward and facilitating power to conduct workshops on advancing race equity in government, the impacts of implicit bias, and the spectrum of community engagement to ownership. The team facilitated the lunch and learn sessions, community forums, and presentations to the city council. Next slide, please. Our second goal is that every city department is governed by the principle of community ownership fostering democratic participation in equity through community-driven decision-making. To achieve this, our top priorities are collaborate with community organizations to develop a shared vision in shaping race equity policy, eradicate barriers for civic engagement by improving methodologies for participatory actions, and strengthen the city's community engagement efforts to increase transparency and trust. Next slide, please. I think, okay. Here's a chart that demonstrates the levels of uh, community engagement to ownership. The objective is to include stakeholders at the beginning of the process when developing policy programs and projects. Um, we had a tendency, well my observation was we had a tendency to put together a plan and then take it to stakeholders to tell them what we're doing, but the community forum was supposed to be engagement. So actually we should be asking them what is it that they need. The spectrum would help us to get to that. The chart helps us to understand where we are as an organization on the spectrum and how we can move to the next level with the ultimate goal of stakeholders feeling they have ownership of the policy program or project because their input has been heard and incorporated. Next slide, please. Now I would like to pass it to my colleague, Deputy City Manager, LaShonda White. Thank you, Ms. Trina. Um, my name is LaShonda White, Deputy City Manager for the City of Richmond. Uh, greetings, Chair, Vice Chair, Task Force members and community. It is truly a pleasure to be here today and present on the work we're trying to do at the local level. So goal three of our race equity work is around city service provision. We're focused on creating a racially equitable employer, being a racially equitable employer, and also promoting racial equity in contracting and procurement. Our first focus was to focus on educating and training city staff to ensure that they are uh, thoughtful in how they hire employees and make sure they're doing it through a lens of race equity. We also want to strengthen our personnel policy and work on our job specifications and descriptions. Sometimes we found that 
um, our classifications and jobs descriptions were limiting um, individuals from joining the task, the, the employ, uh, employment. And so what we have begun to do is um, develop a class and comp study and really work on updating our descriptions and eligibility requirements to allow for any combination of both education and experience and moving away from just focusing on education. We also want to improve our hiring and promotion um, to enhance and maintain a workforce that is representative of the community. Uh, Mr. Johnson stated that our, popula our black population has decreased in the city of Richmond. It's down to about 18%. But it, I am happy to say that the city of Richmond's um, black population for employment is 27% within the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. Our goal four was focus on um, health, li uh, healthy life, uh, life outcomes. In the city of Richmond, we have a health and all policies, which is that we um, are integrating a, a comprehensive approach to bringing health, well-being, and equity considerations into the development and implementation of policies, programs, and services of traditionally non-health-related government systems and agencies. So for us, our three focus areas around uh, equitable housing opportunities, access to healthy food, and then um, improving park quality to make sure all of our residents, especially those in our um, communities that have are predominantly African American, have uh, really great parks and uh, green spaces to access. Next slide, please. As Ms. Trina stated, um, we really are interested in resident engagement and making sure we are not as a government just making determinations about what we think is best for our community, but making sure we're hearing from our community. That is extremely uh, important. So one thing we were able to do is work with UC Berkeley's uh, communities, uh, uh, community um, program and for their Y plan, which is Youth, Learn, Youth Plan Learn Act Now. And they, we were able to work with some residents, some local residents in, in Richmond on an engagement project and really asking them some questions and, and getting real responses from our residents and having them be ambassadors and go out to talk to our community members. And we asked them about what inequalities do they see or experience in the community and we got some really great feedback that we're incorporating into our work at the city level. Next slide. Um, this is just another slide around our Y plan project and from that work we have um, included some of our, we call them Richmond um, ambassadors, um, some Richmond residents to join our internal city task force so it's not just made up of city staff and we are um, really excited about that and making sure we continue to have not only a resident voice but we're also working with some local community based organizations because we know they have their ear to the ground and know what's happening in our communities so that we're not doing this work alone. With that, uh, oh, next slide, please. It is our ultimate goal to have a race equity officer. Um, I am a team lead for our race equity team. However, I have other assignments. A race equity offer, officer would be solely dedicated to race equity work. We believe that this will um, significantly help our efforts. Um, the equity officer would assist city's goal of advancing racial and socially equitable responses, practices, and protocols. We have, um, our city council is supportive of our work. However, we need a champion, we need a race equity officer, ultimately a division that would help us solely focus on this work and achieve this work. Next slide, please. And as you heard, Garib took a look at how we operate internally and how we can prevent harms from occurring and being perpetuated in the, in the present and the future. Richmond, like most cities, is a council manager form of government. None of this would have been possible if we didn't have a black city manager, a black deputy city manager, willing to take this up and implement it as a priority. With that, we thank you for listening and we'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. 
Uh, thank you also uh, to Ms. Uh, Trina Jackson and Ms. White. Um, are there any other comments or questions uh, for the city of Richmond for this excellent presentation? Thank you. Montgomery Sepp, you're recognized. Thank you all for the presentation, all the work that you're doing. I'm um, interested in all of it, um, but especially interested in the homestead ordinance. So I just wanted to know a little bit more detail about that and where you are in the process and how it is, um, how I guess it's complementary, I guess, to the Surplus Land Act. Um, thanks. Yes, and I'll answer and then I'll allow um, <laughs> CM White to jump in if she has any comments. We're currently in the development phase. Um, we are just literally completed our surplus land list act. I mean, our surplus land list um, inventory. Um, and we are gonna be engaging black CBOs as well as other black community organizations. Um, so that way, get the first bite at the apple. Um, but in terms of program design, we are still in the, in the phases of putting that together. And as was said, we wanna make sure that the community has a, has a, has a part in how that program is designed as well. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, then Council Member Johnson, when he was on the, the council, he gave us a heavy, uh, a, a large task in terms of implementation at a local government level to implement reparations work. Um, our city council was in favor of it, so there are some things we have moved further than others. Um, but we have not forgotten this work, which is why uh, we are still in collaboration and connection and still trying to, to implement. So as he stated, we have not, we do have a surplus land list, um, but we are working on some other projects like cannabis equity, um, really focus on parks and infrastructure, um, working with our community-based organizations like uh, the Ed Fund with the Richmond Rapid Response Fund and Guaranteed Income. So we've, we've tried to prioritize and really uh, make sure we are doing as much as we can with the ta with the staff that we have available to us, but thank you. He's being polite. I gave him a 14-page document with footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the feeling on both ends, so um, I, I just would love to keep in touch about all of the work, but that in particular, really, really, I think that that's a wonderful idea and would love to, to see how it comes out and maybe mirror some things that you all are doing. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I too just want to extend my, I mean, um, commend you guys for the great work that you've done. And just curious, what's the budget to stand something up like this? We are open to any money, any funds. What? What is that? We accept all we, donations. We accept all funds, I, any donations, I, 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 okay. um, any allocations in the state budget. No, um, we don't have a huge budget. A, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. Closed okay. mouth doesn't get fed, yeah. right? Um, and in Richmond, we ain't too proud to beg even now. Okay, <laughs> all right. Asking you shall receive, right? Um, but we don't have a huge budget. I think between uh, the city council office budget, we had some money in the city manager's office budget. It probably didn't top fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Okay. Out of a two hundred million dollar budget. Okay. Right. Really focused on race equity, and so it really is city staff that are committed to the work, Got it. that are continuing to champion it, and then working with community-based organizations. So we do, as an example, um, the Richmond Rapid Response Fund, guaranteed income. We have allocated some money through our uh, American Rescue Plan Act to focus about a million dollars on uh, providing some direct disbursements to community members as well as focus on the guaranteed income program. So that is additional funds. Um, that organization has helped raise over a million dollars from private foundations to help do some of this work. We also are working with the Richmond um, Community Foundation and they have a fund called the Black, um, the, it's a black housing fund to really help first time home buyers that some money has been raised by local churches. And so we're just, we're, we're working and collaborating and trying to build that fund. So it's not just city of Richmond. Um, and so all our eggs are not in one basket, but we're continuing to make sure we place money in the budget to continue to focus on this really important work. And I'd Got like it. to add that initially we only had funding to pay for our membership with care. Um, we now, in the city council office, we have $10,000 to help us with training. So it's slowly increasing, and we have a city manager currently that is very um, supportive of this work. Thank you very much. 
Any other comments, questions? I have a question. Uh, so what are the ways in which you all are considering like um, how to show eligibility for um, the various different programs or for, in particular the $25,000 grants? So currently the CBO that administers that program um, is for all current Richmond residents. And then also if folks can prove that they once lived in Richmond, I know they also have access to that and the barrier of proof isn't too high. Um, so yeah, it, we don't plan to alter or change their, their requirements at all. All right, thank you so much, City of Richmond, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, so um, the next item on the agenda is uh, discussion and potential action item number 13, DOJ updates. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, my remarks will be brief. Um, I just wanted to, uh, as you all know, uh, the Department of Justice staff is uh, heavily engaged in preparing the uh, draft report for your consideration uh, for the next meeting. Uh, the plan is to make sure that you all receive uh, the draft uh, in advance of that March meeting so that there can be a robust discussion and, and uh, further recommendations made for implementation into the final draft. Um, we have uh, confirmed the dates for the remaining meetings uh, for the task force. Uh, the next meeting will be March 29th and 30th, and that will be virtual. Um, the uh, following meeting will be a one-day meeting on May 2nd. That will be the meeting when we will be seeking final approval of the report, and that will also be virtual. And then we are planning uh, to convene on the 30th of June uh, once the report is finalized and printed, uh, subject to further direction by the task force in terms of what form and where uh, you would like to um, have that take place. Uh, we have graduated from Blue Jeans to Zoom, uh, so the uh, online platform will be Zoom, and we'll make sure that that link goes out. I know there were some comments about closed captioning uh, being helpful, uh, and the Zoom platform does allow for that, so there will be closed captioning uh, for those who will be participating uh, from the public. Um, and we will continue to use, uh, uh, allow for public comment virtually uh, through that platform. I'm not sure if anyone has any other questions. Uh, Senator Bradford. Yeah, I appreciate that update, but I guess I'm gonna express my concern that as we move to the last two meetings, which I think is gonna be critical, I think we should be in person. I mean, as we work out the final details, I, I'm troubled that this will be over Zoom, I think if there's ever a time that we need to be in the room looking at folks in their eye, it should be on these last two meetings. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, this was only based on the original schedule that was set uh, last fall. It's all up to the task force as to whether they'd like to do something differently. Um, the only caveat I would make to that is that the availability that was given for these meeting dates was based on virtual participation. And so to the extent that members may not be available on those dates for an in-person meeting, we would just need to work that out. Well, I agree with Senator Bradford. I do think that you know, in these last remaining meetings, we should, um, you know, just continue the course and have these in-person hearings. Um, any other thoughts? Um, Member Tamaki, you recognize. Uh, <clears throat> there's no substitute for meeting face-to-face. -face. I, I agree with you, Senator Bradford. Um, I'm hoping our dates don't change. So <clears throat> maybe, I don't know if, as we sit here today, whether <clears throat> everyone's available. I hope so. Um, and <clears throat> I just add that, you know, this morning, I probably counted 
seven cameras. And at the last two meetings, the, the coverage is going to be both regional and California and national, I think. So <clears throat> that is probably another reason to meet face-to-face. Uh, -face. So I'm all for that. Do, do we have a sense from the members whether the dates are going to change? The reason I'm asking is everybody's got really busy schedules, travel, speaking, et cetera. I, oh, I, I, know, I know, but we're trying to coordinate Sorry, basically this as a priority without set, having agreed to dates that would conflict already. So. Were you saying something at the end? Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I'm sorry, what? Were you saying something at the end? Sorry. No, I was just responding that it, let's be very clear. There's no greater priority than these last two meetings, period. Mm -hmm. so, so that is very clear. But uh, I'm sure all of you all here sitting here are already uh, committing to, to dates in April, May, and June. And so we want to avoid a situation where there's any conflict. So I'm wondering, do we, do we know as we sit here today whether if we change to face-to-face -face meetings, that's going to be a problem? I, I, hearing, hearing no objection, I just assume everybody's fine with these dates. Uh, yeah. Member Montgomery, step. Can, um, we just repeat the dates again. I know we have uh, March 29 and 30. Um, and then May 2nd, and then June 30th. Um, if, if we do revert back to in-person, I would presume that we would have to choose a later date than March 29th and 30th, or maybe not. Literally is later this month. Those dates would remain based on the quorum that was established unless you all change the dates. Um, certainly no sooner than March 29th, um, but we were also uh, looking at ensuring that our staff had sufficient time to transition the outlines into the draft form, and then you all had sufficient time once you had a draft to review it, have comments, and discuss it uh, before it comes up for a final vote. Okay, so um, our folks, um, you know, comfortable with the existing dates just in person instead of virtual. So March 29th and 30th, May 2nd, and June 30th. Okay. And then we can entertain a motion. I move that we have in-person meetings. I move that we have in-person meetings for those dates listed. Um, March the 29th. Is there a second? Is there a second? I second. It has been properly moved by Vice Chair Brown and properly seconded uh, by Member Tamaki uh, that the task force uh, will revert to, uh, will go to in-person hearings uh, from March 29th and 30th, uh, May 2nd and June 30th. Uh, is there any uh, discussion on the matter? So to Member Bradford's point, the only out, uh, lingering question would be uh, where would these um, in-person hearings take place? So we would have to have a conversation about that. Um, but let's just deal with the motion that's on uh, the floor right now, which is to uh, uh, meet in person instead of virtual for these dates. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson so that we can um, go to a roll call vote. I just want to, to verify the dates. Uh, Madam Chair, we have March 20, the motion was to have the meeting scheduled for March 29th and 30th, May 2nd and June 30th in person. Is that correct? Thank sure. you. Um, I will call for the vote now. Um, Madam Chair? Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills vote, votes aye. Member Holder? 
Member Holder is absent. Uh, Member Joan Sawyer. Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member um, Scott Lewis is absent. Member Montgomery Stepp. Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members uh, present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Pardon me? Seven eyes. Seven eyes. Holders. Holders missing and Jovan is missing. Um, yes. Member Holder. Uh, She's not here. Was absent. Yeah, so you don't have eight. So. Seven. And Scott Lewis was absent. So we have seven. So That's eight. seven voting. I'm Just sorry, eight. what did I say? Eight. I apologize. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. There were seven members present in voting. Um, there were seven ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. There are seven ayes and zero nays, and thus the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, we will continue as a task force to meet in person uh, for March 29th and 30th, May 2nd, and June 30th. All right, so the um, last part is determining the locations. So I believe um, for June 30th, we said we would have it in Allensworth, um, which is near Bakersfield. Um, but then that, remains where would be the locations for March 29th and 30th and then May 2nd. I think at the San Diego hearing, folks were saying that the Inland Empire kind of was underrepresented, so we haven't been to the Inland Empire, so that could be an option uh, for either March 29th and 30th um, or May 2nd, and then you know, maybe we can think of another city. LA. Um, LA, East Palo Alto, Richmond, there's various different places we could go. Chair, Chair Moore, may I make a comment? Back to Gallup. Space yeah. where we're going to meet. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Attorney Brown and then Member Tamaki. Just a couple of logistical issues for the task force to consider. Um, I know that the legislature is in session. I don't know how that may impact their ability to be physically present. We could check to see if this room is available. It seems to meet all of the needs uh, for one of those sessions where they might be most impacted at least. Um, I'd also like to um, ask that we can check back in with the task force if it is the desire of the task force to be in Allensworth on June 30th, we do need to verify whether logistically that's something that we have the resources to pull off. Um, otherwise, we may need to have an alternative location uh, to consider. Um, Member Tamaki, you're recognized. <clears throat> so I think one other consideration is media market. Yes. And so um, respectfully about Allensworth, uh, it is critical, crucial importance to California history and our whole story, but it's difficult to yeah. get to. And <clears throat> so media market, we're talking about Los Angeles, Sacramento, Bay Area, but basically we want to make it, and this is really a comms um, yeah. consultant thing, but we, we want to make it so easily accessible that it will encourage you know coverage from all over the country. So I, I think that's a big, big concern as we go to you know the, this final stage. And so um, I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I was. I don't know if Sean is here, but I know we've been in conversation with you know folks at NBC who were kind of interested in like the idea of the final meeting being in Allensworth because they were talking about oh there, it could be this whole but production. That, but that's not, it's not practical. Now. Yeah. In, in terms of logistics. Yeah. So that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean they were you know talking about like you know. NBC, MSNBC did a whole production for I think the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. And so they were thinking about doing something similar, you know, in Allensworth, but you know, again, it may not be practical. It could be, you know, somewhere else like Los Angeles or somewhere with the, with the bigger media market. Uh. 
We can entertain a motion for, maybe we can start with this most immediate meeting, March 29th and 30th. Uh, Madam Chair. We can do, oh, we can decide tomorrow. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good point. I forgot, it's day one. Yeah, we can take this up under unfinished business tomorrow if you'd like some time to consider it. Okay, any other updates from the DOJ? Okay, so now the meeting has officially gone into recess. We'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m.